And welcome in to the Wednesday edition of Robbie and Rex Road, 1025-1063 The Game, brought to you by Chuck McDowell and Medical House Calls, Middle Tennessee's best medical care in the comfort and safety of your own home. For more information, go to medicalhousecalls.com. Medical House Calls, where the nearest clinic is your home. Robbie Stanley, Nick Keezer, both live here from Nashville, Tennessee. Joe Rex Road is in Michigan. Joe, good morning. How are you? Well, I'm feeling I, I got serious FOMO. I mean, I'm... I'm like, you know, I, I can never like be at any of these ridiculous Preds games. <laughs> that one last night was about as ridiculous as it gets. It was wild to watch uh, the way that thing went down last night. What a win for the Preds. They're down 3 nothing in the first period. They're down 4-1 in the third period. And they battle all the way back. They tie it up at four in the third. And then Roman Yossi, 40 seconds into overtime, wins it, and not only do they extend the point streak to 18 games, they win the game and pick up two points in a game where you're down by three. And not, Joe, just down by three. Down by three against the reigning Stanley Cup champions who do just about as good of a job as anybody in the league of clogging things up and locking down defensively when they're trying to protect the lead. And, look, there was a, there was a call that I think you can make a pretty good argument Probably went the Predators' way last night on the offside review. But to their credit, after that, I mean, you still got to step up and make some plays, and they did. And, man, what a win, what an environment, uh, what a time last night for the Nashville Predators. I mean, that's uh, – man, that's uh, that's an all-timer. Like you said, first of all, you just don't expect to to come back from that kind of deficit against that team. Um, and, you know, it's just like – like at some point, I mean, I'm I'm sitting there watching, it and it's like, you know what? Hey, th- this is this th- there's going to be something like this. Like, kind of get back to reality a little bit. It's it's not the the end of the world, you know. Understand the the, the race that you're in, and you know, take take the L and and you move on. I mean, like nothing lasts forever, and they actually end up winning that game. Really, really outraged. I mean, the you, you, I know it's three on three, but like the Yossi move to win the game too you know uh, you know after all after 20 whatever minutes he played you know in that game to turn on the jets like that and uh yeah just man they they got something real special going on right now well there's a, there's a magical feel to it and it it looked like again you know i was thinking when it was four to one in the third period last night and, and they were you know trying to mount a comeback but it just didn't feel like it was going to happen i was like you know what one of these was bound to happen at some point. We know they're going to lose in regulation again at some point. And what a run it was. How, what, what you know? How how fun was this to watch? Now the question is like, how can they respond? Like, can they avoid a slide coming up after the streak ends? And then boom, Ryan O'Reilly scores. Forsberg gets the goal. Nyquist gets the goal. And then Yossi. Once they made it four to four, I mean, I mean, I'll be honest with you. Once they made it four to four, and the building was going crazy, I knew they were winning. Like, I I, I knew they were going to win that game. When it got to overtime, I knew they were going to win that game. It just you, – you could feel it kind of building at that point. And they get it done. They get to two points. They're four points up on Vegas now. And then after Winnipeg loses in overtime last night, they're only four back in Winnipeg. So what a difference in result just based on a third-period comeback and the ability to finish the job in overtime. Roman Yossi last night talked about the game. The stick to itiveness of the Nashville Predators and the ability to keep playing their game down three goals. Here's what Roman Yossi had to say after the game. This has been obviously a long streak, but you guys have not trailed much throughout this this entire streak. How, how big, not only to get the win, but to do it the way you did coming back from three, from four one. Yeah, it was huge. Um, like you said, I, f- I feel like this whole streak we were kind of it was always a tight game or we were up and um, being down three nothing. Um, I think it's easy as a team to go like, oh, it's just probably not our game, and it was bound to happen or or wherever. And but um, we just we just stuck with it, and uh, it's a lot of a lot of character. And we're like, hey, we can come back in this game. We're we're not done. There's a lot of game left. Uh, we gotta we gotta stick to our game. And even after we're down four one, going in the third, we knew we knew if we played away, we have we have a chance to come back. And um, obviously, the ending was was pretty fun. That was Yossi after the game last night, and you know. We're going to get into to him a little bit more specifically later in the hour, but yet another example last night. It's been one of the great things about this run, Joe, is it's been different people mostly every night like that have been contributing. And, you know, you've seen big moments from Evangelista and Sherwood and McCarron and 
Jankowski, who by the way scored a big goal last night in the game. I mean, it's been it's been fun to watch the the contributions from everybody. But last night, when you need to have big plays, who was it? Is Ryan O'Reilly, Philip Forsberg, Gus Nyquist, and Roman Yossi. And if you want to point to four guys, especially four skaters that have really carried them all year, those are the four guys. And and they all came up with gigantic plays last night. Yeah. So it's we've talked at other at various times this year about you know over reliance on those guys, but you know I feel like when you when you have what this team has done in the last few weeks which is really balance out more and get contributions from all over and not to put too much on them then maybe maybe that makes it a little bit easier for them in these moments to uh you know to to to, to perform like that you know they don't have the weight of the world on your shoulders at all times then you know you can shine in those moments i mean it, it i i was listening to Barry Trotz with Jared yesterday which is always a good conversation yep. and um, talking about how Ryan McDonough said to him, you know, he had, he hasn't felt this good at this time in the year um, in a long time, which is somewhat talking about, you know, like the system and things like that. So maybe there's something to that too, for how the Preds are, are just playing this well at this time of year. Well, and one of the, it's probably not underrated, but I, one of the keys to this run has, has been just dominance in the third period. And it, it took on a different form last night because, I mean, look, you, you look at the numbers, they, they just they have not trailed a ton during this stretch here. They've mainly been up or they've been in, in tight games where it's been tied. And, you know, I, I think they've trailed for like, you know, uh, before last night, like 16 minutes throughout this whole thing. Like it's been wild how much they've been ahead or, or tied during this stretch. And then last night you're down 4-1 to one to the reigning cup champions, and it just feels like it's not your night and it's over, and yet you still find a way to win. And, you know, we, we keep talking about the building. I thought the building has been great over the last couple of weeks here as they've just been building on this run. It was awesome on Saturday against Detroit. When they scored to make it 4-3 and that goal stood with Forsberg, I mean, I, I don't know that anybody in the building sat down the rest of the night yeah, after it was four to three. The place was going crazy, and then Nike was tied it up at four. I mean, it, it kind of felt like almost an explosion in there. And then, of course, the you know the game winner in overtime. But it was just, uh, you know, I, I think the term like playoff style environment probably gets overused when you're talking about the NHL. But that's what it felt like last night. Was I mean, it felt like prime Bridgestone Arena. 2016, 2017, 2018, kind of that run. Speaking of that, I think this is a good time to rip you. How about um, you, you and Jim Diamond. I, I, you guys got to stop leaving in the third period of doing the Adam Bingen. I mean, you know, like I, I get the convenience of it, but you know, like, like I, I think that I think that you need to stop that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a public declaration right now. It's not gonna happen, but you can, you can make the public declaration. <laughs> I mean. Like so, in a playoff game. I, I mean, don't you think that there's just a way better feel for what's going out there if you're if you're in the arena as opposed to downstairs? Well, probably, but I'm on deadline and have to be done like the second the game is over, and then also get to the locker room. And like but last for, night, but for years, but for years you didn't do that. No, right? I've always Before? done. It. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I thought I thought Vingan was the only one who did that for oh, no. for a long time. Oh no, I've always done it. It was you and Vingan. Yes. Okay. Well. All right, fine. Whatever. So call me out publicly. That's fine. It will yeah, not. That's cool. It will I, not change I, my actions. I thought that you. I thought that you started doing that after Vingan started doing that. Oh no, I'm a leader, not a follower. So you actually, you actually influenced Vingan to do that. I did. <laughs> All right. I mean, I get it, but you can still make the elevator, can't you? I mean, last night I had to change my entire story in like, uh, you know, a minute. Yeah, I guess games like last would have been tough. Would not would not be the best example of why you should do that. Yeah, <laughs> would have been tough. Fair. But look, it was so loud last night, and it didn't really matter where I was in the building. You, I mean, you could feel the. I mean, it was shaking. You could you could feel the, like the building. You could feel the atmosphere. What was going on? And it was just. I think I'm not gonna say the cherry on top, but it was just so different from the the way that other games have gone down during the stretch. I mean, Colorado they pulled away and dominated the third period. And it was fun to watch, but like you, you look at the you know some of the teams they've beaten, Florida was just a statement win on the road. 
And last night, I mean, look, Vegas is below you in the standings. Vegas, to, to me, when the playoffs start, has probably just about as good of a chance as anybody to make a deep run based on the roster that they've constructed and, you know, obviously the, the experience that they have. So, like, to me, last night, the quality of opponent is every bit as much of, as impressive as the Winnipeg, the Colorado, the Florida game that you've won. And you did it in a different way last night that I, I think just – the, the biggest thing beyond the result, and, and look, and last night was kind of, to me, the end of the conversation of, like, they're going to make the playoffs. The playoffs are, are going to happen at this point. Yeah. It would take an epic collapse. But I, I think the, the confidence that they've got right now is, I, I think it, it can't do anything but serve you well. Like, to know that against that team, like I said, and I realized they were on their third goalie last night. So, there is that to, to factor in, but... They are so good at locking you down defensively. And the Predators Predators got outchanced in the third period. They got outshot 13 to 8, but they made the most of their opportunities. I, you know, early in the game, they hit two posts. They had a breakaway with Tyson Berry, they had a wide open net uh, for Novak that uh, Patera the goalie for for Vegas made a great save on. Like, they had plenty of chances early in the game and they just couldn't convert and it kind of felt like it evened out for them in the third period. Yeah, but uh, yeah, it's at that point, it's like, okay, well, this happens. One of those games. I mean, during this stretch, they've won basically every way you can win, right? Yeah. Now, especially especially after last night. And then also, they basically beat, I guess, I guess, well, I guess it started with the loss to Dallas, so they haven't beat them in this stretch, and and not Edmonton either, but they've, they've got a, a growing list of teams that, that are right there at the top of the league and have a real chance to win the Cup that have been in this stretch, too. 615-737-1025, our phone number. What a win for the Nashville Predators last night. We'll take your thoughts on the comeback against Vegas. 615-737-1025 is our phone number. 615-737-1025. More coming up next. You're listening to Robbie and Rex Road. 1025-1063, the game. Hey, Robbie Stanley here. You could say goodbye to busted brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every single game of the tourney, whether you're betting on a big upset or a one seed. It's time to go dancing on America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. Tennessee and Creighton coming up this weekend. I think it's going to be a tough game. I think it's going to be a close game, but I'm going with Tennessee to pull through in the end and to continue to advance in the tournament. But you could take it any way you want to take it. That's 200 bucks that you use on point spreads, money lines. You can even pick who's going to win it all. All you have to do is visit FanDuel.com slash Rob and bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. Once again, that's FanDuel.com slash Rob. Must be 21 or older and present in Tennessee. First online real money wager only. $10 first deposit required. Bonus issued is not withdrawable bonus bets that expire seven days after receipt. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Got a gambling problem? Call the Tennessee Red Line at 1-800-889-9789.
closely by Theodore. They give the puck back now to Yossi, cutting in. He scores! Roman Yossi scores! And the Predators now are 18 games into an unbeaten streak. Oh, my. 5-4 the final. Reds win it last night. Dramatic comeback down 4-1 in the third period. They win 5-4 in overtime. Roman Yossi with the game winner against the reigning Stanley Cup champion Vegas Golden Knights. And the Preds extend their point streak to 18 games. By the way, the last time a team in the NHL had an 18-game point streak, Joe Rex wrote, the 2021-2022 Colorado Avalanche. I seem to recall that team being pretty good. Wow. How about that? Um, so I guess we can start comparing, making that comparison too. We got yeah. the 2017 Preds, 2019 Blues, 22 Avs. Well, how about the uh, – trying to think. How about the uh, – you know, 97 Red Wings. Yeah, I was going to throw that out there. Hey. Who was more of a wagon, this year's Predators or the 97 Red Wings? People are asking. Or, or maybe 02. Maybe 02, oh, 02 Red 02 Wings when they had Hasek in there, get Robitaille and pretty Hall good. in there. Sure. Pretty good stuff. 615-737-1025 is our phone number. Let's go to our 1025 The Game phone line, driven by WilsonCountyHyundai.com. Welcome in Mike in Gallatin. Mike, good morning. Thanks for calling in. Hey guys, good morning. So I owe the team a public apology. I'm about six, seven rolls deep at the Texas Roadhouse in Hendersonville, stress eating, <laughs> watching this hockey game, and uh, I made it through two periods. And it was time. I had to. It was. It was time to go. I. I was having to. I, I was out of buttons on my pants, and it was like it was time to. It was time to pack it up, and I paid the price for uh, leaving the table early. I missed out on the on the third period, but thankfully, uh, uh, the rush job on putting the kids to sleep when we got home from the uh, from the restaurant allowed me to see the uh, the forty second overtime quickly. So I, you know, I'm thankful for the Preds there. My my question is, we're four points out of Winnipeg now. Again, I know we can daydream of this thing going on forever, and we already said that we're probably not going to happen. We are going to lose somewhere down this stretch. But, like, are we in a spot where we want to play the, the, the big juggernaut teams that are in our division, or do you feel better about our, um, about our chances with the other side of the conference? Because, again, if Vancouver holds true, I feel like that might be a better matchup for us than, say, Colorado or Dallas. Yep. I'd like to get y'all's opinion when you guys get to it. Yep, thanks for the call, Mike. We're we're going to get into that actually specifically here coming up here in about ten minutes. So make sure you're tuned in for that. But we're gonna we're gonna get through what I would consider the conceivable playoff matchups. We're going to get into that here in just a few minutes uh, here on the program. But I mean, look, last night was one of those games, and they don't happen often in the regular season. But last night was probably one of those games, Joe, where if you if you went to it. You're probably not going to forget it. Like, if you're a season ticket holder, you go to 41 of those a year. At some point, they kind of just kind of all run together. Last night was one of those games where you know I'll I'll, I'll remember the way that that one went down for a long time, and that that doesn't happen a whole lot in the regular season. No, no doubt. By the way, I thought he was saying he was stress eating the the biscuits right now, and I'm like, geez, man, I didn't know they were open that early. Some um, great rolls, by the way. Yeah, yeah, no, no doubt. Free ad, but you know, hey, what can you do? Um, no, that's one of those. Yeah, that's one of those that like sixty, seventy thousand people say they were at. Yeah, at least. Yeah, I mean, it's it was just a wild, wild game last night. Let's go back to our our one two five the game phone line. Welcome in, Bob and Antioch. Bob, good morning. Thanks for calling in. Good morning, guys. I went down to Florida last week and saw the Predators play the Panthers there, and. The way that they played that night and the way, obviously, they're playing now, I think that they can hold their own against anybody in the uh, first round. My question uh, is this. do you? Th- how do you think the uh, Forsberg, Nyquist, O'Reilly line compares to the Jofa line at its peak? And but, do you think hmm. that – because remember the complaint or the worry about the Jofa line was that it could be uh, worn down in the playoffs – this this line that seems to be bigger and uh, and stronger, and I was, I was just curious about your uh, your take on that. Yep. Thank you. Thanks for the call, Bob. Appreciate it, Joe. This is the best line they've ever had. This this line, Forsberg, O'Reilly, Nyquist, the season that they've had, the numbers, everything you want to point to. This is the best line they've ever had. I mean, Forsberg 
reached his 40th goal, his 80th point last night. O'Reilly gets to 25 with his goal last night. Nyquist gets to 20. He's going to end up with 70-something points at the end of this. I mean, the the sustained level of excellence over the course of now more than 60 games is aligned together. This is the best stretch that a line has had in the history of the franchise. This is – so, I mean, look, they, they haven't been together as long as the Jofa line was, and obviously they, those that line came up with – some big plays in in playoff situations, and it's yet to be determined whether or not this one will. There's no reason for me to believe that this line won't do that in the playoffs. I mean, you got guys that have played a ton of playoff games in Forsberg, O'Reilly, and Nyquist, and they've now been together and built a, an incredible chemistry. So, to me, this is the best line they've ever had. Yeah, I mean, to Bob's question, I think Arvidsson in particular was the guy who maybe in the playoffs, you know, the physicality kind of reduced his, you know, a little you know, he, a little less time. Obviously, it was such a fun line to watch. And when he was going with that speed, with what those other guys did, and when Johansson was, you know, was, was playing his best, it was a very good line. But it's hard to argue with what you said there, um, you know. And, uh, and at Forsberg, like, you know, Forsberg is much older than he was then, but Forsberg is better than he was then. There's no question. Which is, you know, I mean, and that's, and I, and I think also it just, it, it, there is, it, there's the individuals on the line and then there's the collective, uh, you know, just how they improve and, and, and help each other. And this, this, these guys just have incredible chemistry. I mean, O'Reilly is just, just such a, he's just a winner and just so good at, all the little things, you know, yep. and, and then, like you said, but you've been talking about it, you've been writing about it. I mean, Nyquist is having this incredible year that it re- I don't think anyone realistically thought he could have a year like this. So, I, I, I think, I think you're dead on. But, but I like the comparison. I mean, I mean, I mean sure. it, it's certainly those two lines. I just wish that you know, Jofa was never used. I hate that term. <laughs> I mean, you can name this one. Nobody's named it yet, as far as I know. Mm, this could be your okay. responsibility. All right, we'll work on that. We're, we're going to get, like I said, more specifically into the the playoff matchups themselves coming up in the choice is yours here in just a few minutes. Uh, but it does feel like this team believes that they can be dangerous against anybody they play. Man, I, I talked to to Philip Forsberg about that after the game last night. Here's what Forsberg had to say. How much belief is there at this point with the streak that you guys can be as dangerous as anybody in the Western Conference of the way you're playing? No, I think there's there's a ton, ton tons of belief in our in our group, and obviously the uh, uh, games like this doesn't doesn't take any way away from that. But at the same time, it's uh, yeah, the, the start we obviously ideally don't want to put ourselves down three at home against uh, in, in a big game like that. But uh, when it ends like it did, obviously we can get away with it. But um, yeah, no, I think. Our confidence is high, and we we keep keep working, keep wearing teams down, and um, yeah, that was a good one. I mean, they they for obvious reasons, confidence should be high, and the way they're going right now, I've said it throughout the whole the whole streak. It's not a fluke. Like they the numbers suggest that they are deserving the results that they get. And last night was probably a little bit of a different game. I mean, the the first period. They got pushed around by Vegas. I actually thought in the second they played pretty well, and the scoreboard at the end of it didn't show it because they both got a goal in the third period. And you know everybody's going to talk about the offside today that the Predators probably got away with. I mean Vegas had clearly chicken winged Jeremy Lozon on the way up the ice, and it didn't get called, so it kind of evens out that way yeah. in terms of calls that they missed last night, but. Last night, a different game. Even in the third period, like it, it's not like the Predators just totally dominated them in the third period. They got outshot thirteen to eight. They just made their shots count, and sometimes that's that's all that matters. But for the most part in this stretch, Joe, they against Florida, against Colorado, against Winnipeg, against some of these really good teams, they have dominated, and that that's what I, I think allows your mind to start to wonder what this could actually end up being. Yeah, I mean, I, we're past the fluke, smoke and mirrors stuff. I mean, it's you know, it's into, it's into really just. I mean, they're going to be you know the underdog in whatever matchup they they get. But I think they're also probably going to be um, a sexy pick for a lot of people too. Which I mean, you know, you can look at that I guess different ways too. But I mean, it's on to 
matchups and like they are right there with these other teams in the West and they're going to be in the fight. Come up next, it's time for the Choice is Yours and all Nashville Predators edition of the Choice is Yours. We'll take your thoughts. 615-737-1025, our phone number. You're listening to Robbie and Rex Road, 1025-1063, the game. Choices to make. Like right 
now. It's the choice is yours. Built by Jared Companies. You have a choice. So when you have a need for site and utility work, fire protection, concrete, and asphalt services, the choice is simple. It's Jared Companies. For more, visit jaredcompaniesinc.com. The choice is yours. Now on Robbie and Rex Road. It's time for the choice is yours on Robbie and Rex Road. Presented by Jared Companies. Your one-stop shop for site and utility work, fire protection, paving, and concrete needs. Get your free estimate today at jaredcompaniesinc.com. Or call them today at 615-515-1270. That's 615-515-1270. A National Predators edition of The Choice is Yours today. So, Joe, let's start with uh, what Mike from Gallatin asked us in the last segment. Going through the possible playoff matchups. And you look, there's a few that I think are more likely than others. Right now, the three most likely, I would say, would be Dallas, Colorado, and Vancouver. Are the three most likely first-round opponents for the Predators. Winnipeg is still in there, although they're five points back of the division lead now for Dallas, and they're three points back of Colorado. And I just think Winnipeg, at this point, barring a change, is going to either be third in the Central or the Predators are going to pass them for a wild card spot. So you could include them in this discussion if you want to, but I'll go Dallas, Colorado, Vancouver, and the other one I'll throw in there is Edmonton because Edmonton is eight points back of Vancouver, but they've also got two games in hand on them. So we'll go those four teams, Dallas, Colorado, Vancouver, Edmonton. Rank them one to four in terms of the playoff opponents, the matchups that you think are most advantageous for the Nashville Predators. Who would like to start? Well, I'll I'll go. Yeah, I'll start. So one, as in most desirable of those four, I'm going Dallas. Two, I'm going Vancouver. Three, I'm going Edmonton and four Colorado, but three and four to me. Like there's a gap to me and then three and four. That's just how, and yeah, look, none, none of these match. I mean, all these teams, Vancouver has been a tough matchup for the president. Dallas has been a decent matchup for the Preds this year, the regular season for whatever that's worth. And then we, of course, Dallas, I guess, gets some kind of credit for this stretch too I for so. putting nine on them but that that's how i would do it I, I i go dallas vancouver and it's close and then there's a gap and then edmonton and colorado it's i mean either of those i don't like those matchups nick keezer one through four dallas colorado uh edmonton vancouver how do you rank those playoff opponents for the predators i would start with dallas I just think the way that they have played against Dallas, obviously the most recent matchup did not go their way whatsoever, but that's not indicative of how they're currently playing right now. I'd go Dallas. I'd go Vancouver. My bottom two changed just a little bit. I've got Colorado, then Edmonton. I just think the way that Edmonton plays, and especially how they've manhandled the Preds at times, I just... I don't like that matchup personally. I think Colorado, yeah, they loaded up for sure. But I also think at times their goaltending can struggle a little bit, I think, with Gorgiev back there. So I think for the Predators' sake, if they did draw the Avalanche, I think it would go a little bit better than maybe some fans think. I think I think that one sweep that went way of the Avalanche, I think it would not look anything like that this time around if they did end up playing them. I think we all agree Dallas, Vancouver – or, or one and two in whatever order you want to put them. I kind of go back and forth on which one I think is a better matchup. I mean, the problem with Vancouver, and you could, I mean, it's to some degree about Edmonton, even though I think we have, we know more of what Edmonton is than I think we do Vancouver. They hadn't played Vancouver in forever. Like, it's been, it's been months since they've seen Vancouver. And Vancouver's good. Uh, they've got, you know, when, when Thatcher Demko is healthy and he's on, he's a good goalie. They have, I think probably still the Norris Trophy favorite, although that's got to be changing with each passing game. We'll see what happens. But in Quinn Hughes, Besser and Pedersen, they got they're loaded up front. So, like Vancouver's a good team. What what's Vancouver going to be like in the playoffs? I don't know. Like so, I I kind of go back and forth on Dallas and Vancouver as the most advantageous matchup. I would go Edmonton three and Colorado four. I think Colorado, Colorado to me, is the one that you clearly want to avoid, and I I know that I know the Predators are two and zero against them, and they're, we're going to see them again on, on Saturday that matchup to see you know what that looks like and, and gather more information that way. And this time it'll be on the road, which has been the toughest place in the league to play this year 
and Denver. So you're going to get a, another good look at that if you're the Predators on Saturday. The reason I've got them behind Edmonton is the pressure on Edmonton when the playoffs come this year is going to be unbelievably high. Like Colorado, I mean, there's always pressure, but Colorado won the Stanley Cup a couple years ago. Edmonton yeah. has been knocking on the door and knocking on the door, and if they don't do it this year, I mean, that team is going to get – I mean, they're just going to get ripped by the media, by the fan base, everybody. Like, at some point, they have to break through and win when you have Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl. And I just wonder, like, whether it's the Preds or anybody else, like, if you rolled into Edmonton and you took game one in a series, and the goaltender especially, and Skinner looks shaky, the noise over there is just going to be so loud. So while I don't like the matchup for the Predators against Edmonton, and I don't really like it against Colorado either, to me the the main difference is kind of the psychological part of it. I, I, I've got Edmonton three, Colorado four. Makes sense. And, yeah, you, that's true. I mean, sometimes that pressure, you know, like Colorado was under massive pressure after blowing it in 21. Yep. And they, they won it in 22. So maybe this is the year the Oilers do that. But I but I agree. Going in, that that's a good factor. On, on the Roman Yossi front, and we're going to get into the, the Hart Trophy discussion here in a minute. But I'll, I'll throw it to you this way. Which one is more deserving? Roman Yossi of Norris Trophy votes, Andrew Burnett, Jack Adams. What do we think? If you had to pick one, Man. I think that's a tough one. That is a very good question. Um, you know, the thing is, like, you, you can qu- you can quantify the, you know, the Norris stuff a little better than the Jack Adams stuff. Oh, my gosh. I think, I, I think I'd go Brunette and the Jack Adams. I, it, it, just because, you know, I think – first of all you you do have to go with what did we think of a team going into the season that's a huge part of it and i know some people hate that um and i'm not, i'm not against you know coach of the year awards going to great coach for great team we thought was great and was great but typically it's the surprise teams and obviously Tockett has been the guy who everybody has sort of uh, identified for a long time but i think between the expectations and then the course of the season and the dominance now that's happening. I think, I, I mean, I think Yossi has a really good case too, for sure. I mean, Yossi has a case probably for multiple awards, but I think I'm going to go Burnett by a hair there. Nick Keezer, better case, Burnett for the Jack Adams, Yossi for the Norse. I kind of tend to agree with Joe, but I'm going to go Yossi for this reason. I think Andrew Burnett, will have another year to prove the consistency to what they have right now. And they may not have the same looking team next year. There's no guarantee whatsoever. There never is when you move on. But I think that when he is here in Nashville, I think you have to look at what the body of work could be for next season, what the expectation could be with a few different faces on this roster next year. And maybe that challenge with maybe the better expectation of, Hey, we've got these younger guys here now. What can they do with that? And I think that's more interesting for me. Yossi, I think, is strictly deserving of this because if you look at what he's done ever since they turned this around, but also since the start of the calendar year in 24, he's been by far one of the league's best players. I mean, you know, Robbie, you phrased that question last night. He's getting heart. He's getting that this heart attention. So I think you have to think about what he has done not just the entire season, but also during this latest stretch. And he's absolutely carried this team, unlike any other player has for his team this season. It's a really hard one because I, I think I think both can make a really good case for it. I think Vancouver might be the primary competition for both. Although, I mean, Kel McCarr is also great competition for Yossi and the Norris. Uh, I, I will go Yossi with the Norris, but it's a it's a slight edge. Like Brunette, you start to reach a number where it, it forces people to pay attention. And the time of the year in which it's happening, this 18 game point streak. I mean, the whole league was watching that game last night. I mean, Elliot Friedman was tweeting about it. Pierre LeBron was tweeting about it. Everybody in the league was watching the Vegas and and the Predators and that comeback last night. And I, I do think that both are going to get 
significant attention and significant consideration for both of these awards coming down the stretch here. I'll go Yossi by a hair, but it's really close. I mean, Andrew Burnett has clearly done a masterful job here. And last night, probably another great example of that of, you know, basically he said he walked in there after the second period and was like, I mean, or after the first period when they were down three, nothing and said, all right, this is, this is another opportunity here to figure out what you're made of. And they responded in a, in a big way after that. So I, I think both are going to get serious consideration down the stretch. I'll go Yossi by a hair. And to that point, does Roman Yossi deserve consideration for league MVP? There's people around the league that are starting to think the answer to that question is yes. We'll dissect that coming up next. You're listening to Robbie and Rex Road, 1025-1063, the game.
Welcome back in. Robbie and Rex Road, 1025-1063 The Game. We are live from our Spring Hill Heating and Cooling Game Nashville studios, keeping your home feeling comfortable all year round. Robbie Stanley, Joe Rex Road, Nick Keys are here with you on this Wednesday morning. Score big this spring with Lee Company and the Nashville Predators in the 10K Power Play Giveaway. Enter for a chance to win a Kohler home generator or $10,000 towards Lee Company home services. Go online to leecompany.com slash giveaway in order to enter. In the 10K Power Power Play Giveaway, contrast entries are accepted until Saturday, April the 20th. Lee Company, all you need. Roman Yossi, another big moment last night. He has been sensational throughout this entire stretch and as Nick pointed out in the last segment, really since the calendar year flipped to 2024, his numbers are just outrageous, and they're off the charts. And he, I think, is going to get consideration for the Norris Trophy. And there are some, Joe, wondering whether he should start getting consideration for league MVP. I saw Brian Boyle, former Nashville Predator and uh, current analyst on NHL Network, put this out there last night. Uh, after the goal was scored by Yossi in overtime, and he just threw, out, threw it out there. Yossi for heart was his question on Twitter. McKinnon, Kucherov, Yossi, Panarin in, uh, in obviously, New York. It, it's, a, it's a crowded field right now. There's always McDavid that you have to consider. You know, I, I, they, were, they were talking with some other guys on the NHL Network last night about this, too, of, of whether or not Yossi deserves heart consideration. I've heard Elliot Friedman and Jeff Merrick bring this up. So the conversation is out there as to whether or not Yossi belongs in the heart conversation as league MVP. Joe, where do you come down on that? How do you view Yossi and his candidacy for the heart trophy as league MVP? I mean, a lot of times these late sort of mentions, you know, it's, it's hard to actually build the momentum enough. But the one thing about it is in some years, it's obvious who's going to win it by now. And this year it's not. So I do feel like the sort of just the sort of wide open field here at the end of March compared to some years gives him at least a chance, right? I mean, it's, I think it would have to be like last night is one of those moments where it's like, holy crap. And then he does what he does in overtime. But anybody paying attention, and just like Nick said, I mean, he's been the best defenseman in, in hockey this year. You know, this calendar year, he's been the best defenseman, period. Now that's the best defenseman, you know, the heart trophy, if they, you know, I think it would take more winning <clears throat> and more moments like that from him too, even though, um, you know, he, I mean, it like that's asking a lot, but like, I, I think it would take more things to make people absolutely stand up and notice and say, Oh my goodness. I mean, if you watch Roman Yossi through the course of a game and all these people who were talking about this, I think they watch enough of everyone to know, you know, to know what they're looking at. I mean, I mean, he's, he's spectacular, but that's still a, that's a big order here. And you, we know who that award usually goes to. I don't think he has much of a chance, just to be honest with you. I mean, not that he shouldn't. I, I think he, I think he absolutely belongs in, in the, in the conversation just because like when you start to break down like what the award really means and like the, the most valuable player to their team. The, I think right now with the way that he's playing, there are very few people in the league that are more valuable than what he's doing right now. Now, having said that, like Nathan McKinnon to me is going to win the Hart Trophy. I mean, the, the guy has been unbelievable all year long. Colorado is going to end up being, if not the best, one of the best teams in the Western Conference from a record standpoint. I mean, he's been outstanding. Where what's he at right now? Let's see. He is in a race with Kucherov for the most points in the league. So McKinnon has 123 points. You're talking 45 goals, 78 assists. He's going to end up around 130 points this year. So he's probably going to win it. I think Panarin has, has a good case. Kucherov in Tampa has a good case. He just it's it's rare to see defensemen kind of break their way through in these discussions here. But right. having said that, like, like I, you know, is, is Roman Yossi as valuable to his team as Nathan McKinnon is to his? Probably not, especially over the long haul. But with the way that he's playing right now, and I, I think that's where the kind of the momentum and this conversation comes from. With the way that Yossi is playing right now and the way he's played for basically three months at this point, I, I think he has been – every bit as valuable as some of these other names that you want to throw out there. Now, McKinnon has done it 
from start to finish this year, and I think that's ultimately going to be the difference, and I, I think he's going to win. But I, I would be surprised if Yossi ends up being a finalist, and I, and I think – I think that's uh, I think that's something that probably needs to change. Like it's always a forward thing, and I get it. Like forwards are, are yes. extremely valuable, but I think if you pay attention to what Yossi is doing right now, he, he's been unbelievably valuable for this group. Well, I do wonder if the conversation about the heart helps him with the Norris. You know, yes. that's a, I mean, that's what the you know that, that's the the realistic, the more realistic, obviously, opportunity for him. And people talking about him for the heart. You know, I don't, I don't hear them talking about the other guys for the heart right now. So maybe that helps them because I think he really needs to really have a shot at that thing. Let me ask you this. So he wins the Norris trophy a few years ago in kind of that, that shortened season with COVID he puts up 96 points two years ago and does not win the Norris trophy finished in second place that year, but was unbelievable from start to finish. He's not going to hit 96 points this year. I mean, they got 10 games left. He's at 73. So, I mean, I guess unless he, you know, goes on an absolute, complete, ridiculous rampage here, he's probably not getting to 96. He probably is getting to, like, you know, 85, somewhere in that neighborhood with the way that he's playing right now. So which version of Roman Yossi is the best? Was it the Norris Trophy year, the version two years ago, or the version we're seeing right now? Yeah, it's a great question. It, it's so different because, like, he seriously, like, I feel like then he had the puck always. You know what I yep. mean? So, I mean, you could look at it and say, like, you could you could view it as, you know, he had a bigger role, I guess. But I feel like what he's done with this system now, figured out ways to still be lethal, but also I mean, everything else is better. I mean, the system is is working so well and he's picking his spots and still finding ways to dominate games. I, I, I don't know. I, I mean, that's a really tough question. It just, it's your prisoner of the moment right now because of how well they're playing and how well he is playing. But I do feel like back then it was like, you know, I mean, it seriously was like a guy carrying a team. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think, I think actually my answer is probably the 96 point year, but I mean, the the way he's playing right now is every bit as good as that year. I mean, it's right there on par with it. And it's a, like you said, it's a different way of doing it. I mean, he's he's not carrying the puck up the ice all the time, and the offensive system is not just going through him at all times. So it, it's a different way of doing things this year. But, you know, you start to wonder, you know, he's 33. It, I mean, it's not like he should be – in the absolute prime of his career right now, and he continues to play incredible hockey. And I, I've said it with him for a long time. Like I, I've always thought his contract is going to age pretty well just because of how gifted a skater he is. And, and at some point when his skating ability falls off a little bit, it's not like he's just going to be unable to move out there. Like He's such an elite skater that when it does fall off, He's probably just going to be a good skater instead of an elite skater at that point, and you can still play a long time in the league being that way. But, I mean, last night another example of that, I mean, three on three, he and Kale McCarr have probably got to be the two most dangerous defensemen in the league with just their ability to separate from people, and that was on display again last night. I mean, he got he they gave him an inch of space last night, Joe, and he took full advantage of it. Yeah, just turn the Jets on at that point after that kind of a game. Pretty amazing. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that uh, I do feel like maybe this system, like we talked about earlier, maybe it's helping him a little bit too, you know, if, if at this time of year. And maybe it will be a long-term thing too that helps him a little bit. And that's why the answer probably is a few years ago because it, it was so much was on him. And I do feel like when you when it just advance the puck and then get into the play when you can't, I mean, that's that that's got to be less wear and tear on a defenseman, right? I would think so. And I, I think it – it has obviously been something that he's had to adjust to, but he's adjusted at this point about as well as you can do it. 615-737-1025. Big win for the Preds last night. We'll continue to take your thoughts on the local professional hockey team. Also, there's some there's some stuff on the playoff matchup front uh, on the text line that I, I want to get to and, and touch a little bit more on that. We'll do that next. This is Robbie and Rex Road, 1025-1063, the game.
Hour number two, Robbie and Rex Road, 1025-1063 The Game, brought to you by Chuck McDowell and Medical House Calls, Middle Tennessee's best medical care and the comfort and safety of your own home. For more information, go to medicalhousecalls.com. Medical House Calls, where the nearest clinic is your home. Robbie Stanley, Joe Rex Road, Nick Keezer. Preds win again last night, down 4-1 to one in the third period against the reigning Stanley Cup champions. They come all the way back. They tie it up at four. They win 40 seconds into overtime on a goal by Roman Yossi. Point streak at 18 consecutive games. They are 16-0-2 during that stretch. And they put themselves in a position where the playoffs are almost a certainty at this point. I mean, it would take a, a pretty incredible collapse. They're 10 up on St. Louis with 10 games remaining. And they've got Arizona coming up on Thursday. Colorado at a huge test on Saturday. So the Predators in a great spot right now. Now four points up on Vegas and only four points behind the Winnipeg Jets for third place in the Central Division. We're taking your thoughts on the Preds all show long, 615-737-1025. Paul Kuharski from paulkuharski.com will join us later this hour, right around uh, sometime in the neighborhood of 730, 745, and he'll be here until 9 o'clock talking all things Tennessee Titans. So looking forward to that. Coming up with PK. Let's go to our 1025 The Game phone line, driven by WilsonCountyHyundai.com. And welcome in Adam in Portland. Adam, good morning. Thanks for calling in. Hey, Robbie, man. Hey, dude, did that not like for two seconds feel like Dallas when you're like, oh, God, it's three nothing. Well, I, I'm an idiot for feeling like it's the same. This is not the same team, dude. This is different. Like, they are nasty. And that wasn't like they came back against some chumps, man. They didn't come back against, you know, some of these dudes we pushed over on the street. They come back against the champs. So, it's wild, man. I, I don't even know what to make of them. I, I'm not, I don't think we've ever seen a hockey team like this. Like, that this young, like it's not like we have a bunch of nine, ten million dollar guys. We got a couple, but like this, it's all young dudes and everybody. I mean, uh, 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 Mark Dukowski or whatever he he ends up starting the scoring last night. Like that's that's awesome. Like it's a different dude every single night, and that's what's incredible about the streak. So I really don't know what to make of the team. Like I I almost wrote them off after Dallas, which is the you know emotional fan in me. Well, I think everybody did. Time, like. Like they're they're amazing, dude. This amazing team to watch. They are so much fun to watch. Yep. Thanks for the call, Adam. I mean, I, I think everybody, for the most part, pretty much wrote them off after Dallas. And what to make of them now? I, look, Joe. I think what to make of them now is pretty simple. They're a good hockey team. I mean, it's pretty clear at this point. They're they're sixteen zero and two. I, I've talked about it before. The the numbers, the underlying metrics, anything you really want to point to, shows you that this is not a fluke and that they're good. I mean, they're they're a good hockey team and. What exactly is that going to translate to in the postseason? I don't know. I mean, they're good hockey teams all the time. They get beat in the first round, and it's one and done. You know, I think some of that's going to be matchup dependent, and we've we've gone through those matchups, like some of them more than I do others. But what I make of the group right now, Joe, is they're good. I mean, this is a good hockey team. I, I think we're past the point of, man, this is just kind of out of nowhere. I mean, they, at the, I mean 18 games is a long time. That's a significant chunk of the season. Yeah, no doubt. And so, yeah, look, it, it, again, it's not smoke and mirrors. They're a good hockey team. How good, you know, how does it translate to the playoffs? You know, what's the matchup? I mean, all those things we don't know. But, I mean, this is an incredible run. I, I, look, I do think that the last time, and I wore the shirt yesterday, the Vibin shirt, you know, the last time that the Preds had, they had a great second half. They had a heck of a run. It wasn't this, but it was good. It was really good. Yep. And I think that was a good team going to the playoffs. That was a good team. I mean, they, they gave the Hurricanes a very good series. So, you know, it's not like it's been that long. But but this this is different in, in, in a number of ways. This team is better than that team. And also, it's just the fact that it's it's just a fresh start this year. And it's supposed to be like... The, you know, this is supposed to be the one year where you're like, okay, you might have to eat some dirt this year, you yep. know, I mean, uh, and instead it's this. So what does that mean for the future? I don't know. I mean, the one thing that Adam said there, you know, and we, as we've talked about, it's actually, I mean, it's really not a lot of young, young guys. No, it's, you know, like young, you know, there, there's some younger guys and then there's definitely some of the most important players in this team are older. Let's go back to our one on two, five, the game phone line. Welcome in Weston. Weston, good morning. Thanks for calling in. Good morning, guys. Um, yeah, kind of like piggybacking off of Adam White. One thing I've noticed about this team is we found their identity. Like, I mean, this is going back to if you go back into the early days of Barry Trotz when he finally made it the playoff contender. I mean, this is his bread and butter. It's rough him up, 
you get physical and you just pound away at the net. And now that Bruno is kind of doing that, I mean, I'm glad Florida fired him back in the day. So, I mean, now we're capitalizing off of his coaching ability. So I'll hang up and listen, guys. Yep, thanks for the call, Wes. I mean, one underrated part of the game last night, Joe, it, Cole Smith absolutely annihilated Chandler Stevenson as he was coming out of the offensive zone. That got the building going a little bit. I think got the bench going a little bit, and they were, you know, they didn't, they didn't roll after that. They, you know, they gave up a, a big goal at the end of the second period after they had made it three one. And you thought, well, that's probably it. I mean, if you could, if yep. you could have kept it three one, or maybe got it to three two at the end of the second, you're going to have a chance in the third. Once they made it four one, I know I was like, you know, all right, three goals in one period against Vegas is going to be hard to accomplish, and yet that's exactly what they did, and they end up getting the win. You know, we were we were discussing playoff matchups earlier, and you know, I, I think most people would agree Colorado Edmonton would be at the bottom of the list of first round opponents that you want to see. There there is one part of this that I think people are making way too big of a deal out of, which I understand why, because it happened in twenty sixteen. Like the travel part of it with Vancouver and Edmonton. I get it. I get you know, Van, I get to remember though, like the, the 2016 part of this was was extreme. Like, they had seven games in Anaheim, yeah. and it was seven games of just, like, I mean, you know what Predators Duck series were like then. I mean, it was like physical hand-to-hand combat out there. San Jose was a big kind of physical team as well. And Edmonton's not really that. Vancouver's not really that. Like, it, it's just different matchups. So, I, I understand the travel part of it. Like, it, it feels like after 2016, nobody around here ever wants to travel again in the playoffs, and I get it. <laughs> I'm not as concerned about the travel as I think other people are. I mean, the other team has to travel too. Yeah, it's way down the list. I mean, the other yeah, exactly the other team travels too, and yeah, that that particular year, sixteen two seven game series, both game sevens out there, so it's a th- third time out there, third time having to go out there both times, right? I mean, that, <laughs> yeah, you know, that's you're just not going to have that too often, so. That's way down the list of considerations, but I mean, you can throw it in there with sure. why da- I would pick Dallas. Let's go back to our one zero two five. The game phone line welcoming George. George, good morning. Thanks for calling in. Good morning, guys. Uh, a lot of things have been said about last night, and I got to say it was one of, one of the most exciting comebacks I've ever seen. But nobody's mentioned, I don't think, yet about the number of hits. We had thirty seven hits. They had seventeen hits. I think we're selling a lot of ice packs right now. Yep, thanks for the call, George. I mean, the Cole Smith one we, we talked about was a big moment in the game. You know, Lozon was back in there last night. They paired him with Shen, and then, you know, they kind of moved some guys around. Carrier was out with an upper body injury, which, by the way, I mean, I have no inside information on, on Carrier, but he skated yesterday morning in the morning skate. So, unless he got hurt from yesterday morning until last night's game, I don't think it's that serious with Alex Carrier. But it was good to see Lozon back in there. I thought he and Shen kind of struggled a little bit early on. I mean, the hits are important. I mean, you want to have a physically imposing team. I think the Predators do have that. You know, Shen, Lozon, that fourth line with McCarron and Smith. And, and look, even guys like Forsberg and O'Reilly, like, they're big dudes. Like, you, you, you're not going to push those guys around. So, I think that's important. I, I don't want to overblow it with the hits. You know, most of the time when you have a gigantic hit gap, it means you don't have the puck quite as much. And that's not necessarily the case with the Predators because they've been hitting everything that moves all year long. But certainly, like if you if you have your druthers, Joe, this time of year, you would you want to be a team that can initiate some physicality that can also handle it when the other team tries to dish it your way. And I do think this Predators team is equipped to do that. Yeah, and as you go in the postseason, I think that I think that matters too. You know. That just it it turns into more the style of the game, and uh, the Preds, uh, you know, the Preds can play that way. And you know, Lausanne obviously has gotten a lot of accolades for what he's done, and he's been an all around good player. Yeah, it's really good to have him back in the lineup. Six one five seven three seven one zero two five our phone number. More of your calls and texts on the Nashville Predators. We'll continue to break down possible playoff matchups. Take your thoughts on that as well. You're listening to Robbie and Rex Road one zero two five one zero six three. The game.
Hey, folks, if your bracket is busted, don't worry about it because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of this tournament. Joe Rex here letting you know whether you're betting on a big upset, we've had some of those, or a 1C, they're all still alive. It's time to go dancing on America's number one sports book because right now new customers get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. Been talking Tennessee Creighton all week. I'm going to stick with it. I like the Vols in this matchup, and I don't like Creighton's ability to guard Dalton Connect. I think he's over on points in this game. That's 200 bucks you can use on point spreads, money lines. You can pick who's going to win it all. My pick continues to be Purdue. Just visit Fando.com slash Joe102 bet on college hoops till they cut down the nets. And you must be 21 or older in present Tennessee. But in wager, only $10 for a deposit required. Bonus issued is now withdrawable. Bonus bets that expire seven days after receipt. See terms at sportsbook.fando.com. Gambling problem called the Tennessee Red Line, 102.5, 1063 the game. Dramatic win for the Predators last night. Taking your thoughts, 615-737-1025. Got some tickets to give away, a pair of tickets to see Fallout Boy at Bridgestone Arena coming up on Sunday, March 31st. That is this Sunday. Be caller 5, 615-737-1025. 615-737-1025. Caller 5 will win a pair of tickets to see Fallout Boy at Bridgestone Arena coming up this Sunday, March 31st. 
Joel, on the playoff matchup front, so they're four points behind Winnipeg right now for third in the division, four points up on Vegas for that uh, first wild card spot. You know, a lot's going to be made of, of the Winnipeg part of this. Can you catch them? Can you not? Like, honestly, I don't know that I think that that's a huge deal right now, what, one way or the other. Like, to me, I mean, I guess the only way it's a it's a gigantic deal is if you are a believer in what we just talked about and, and you want no part of the travel, right? Because if you get third, you're playing either Dallas or Colorado. Like, if you pass Winnipeg and you get to third – you're going to play either Dallas or Colorado. That's that's your first round opponent. If you re- hang around in wild card one, well, if Vancouver finishes ahead, you're going to be playing the 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 Central Division part of this. If like Dallas or Colorado wins the West, you'd be playing Vancouver or Edmonton if you finish in wild card one. So there's a lot of different ways this thing can go. Like to me, and, and maybe you know, I'm sure the Predators. I mean, they just want to get in, get in. They don't really care who they play. Like if you're operating under the assumption that I think you and I are, and like Colorado is probably not necessarily the team you want in the in the first round, well, it's hard to answer whether or not you know the 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 getting to third in the central is the best path because right now it's looking like Dallas and Colorado is going to come down to the end here. I mean, Colorado yep. is two points back of, of Dallas, and Colorado has been right there with the Predators over the last stretch is one of the hottest teams in the league. Now, they did lose last night, but without knowing who's going to win the division at this point, and that could go down to the very last day, I can't tell you whether or not I think getting to third in the division is a big deal right now because of the matchups that all go into it. Right. Yeah, I mean, Colorado does have a game in hand, right? With Dallas? They have one, yes. One game in hand. Yeah, down, down two points. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the other day we're like, yeah, I, I, I still would guess this. I still would guess that Colorado, just because of how they've played in general, that they would end up emerging and winning the division, in which case it would definitely be worthwhile getting the three. But I don't know that. I mean, Dallas is right there. So I think it's just – obviously, this is one of those things that we do and we can do and talk about the matchups, and obviously the team, it's it just – can you can you, can can you you bring that game every night consistently – um and and just win as much as you can win and then see what happens at the end yeah i mean if you're worried about that stuff i think that's that probably doesn't bode well for you in the playoffs i mean the preds need to be thinking that they can beat anybody and they should think that the way they're playing right now but yeah it really like winning or losing could help or hurt you at this point it's just too it's too hard to to figure out exactly how it's all going to shake out so um, are we selling the stars have, too short in terms of like, I think all three of us picked the stars as the, the matchup that's most advantageous for the predators. They did just waltz in here and absolutely destroy them last time that they played. Are we selling the stars too short? Well, I, I mean, I, I ranked them number one. That doesn't mean I ranked them as a great matchup. You know, I, I mean, it's just like they, they, by they, to me, they just happen to be of those other ones, I, I narrowly pick them because we have seen, and of course, like you said, the Preds have the embarrassing loss of embarrassing losses. They also have the blown game of blown games against Dallas. But for b- most of that game and then previous matchups, they did match up well with them. You know, um, I mean, that's basic. That's what I'm basing it on. You know, I mean, yeah. that's really, really nothing else. So yeah, I mean, stars, stars could win the cup for sure. <laughs> so. Nothing is uh, is a, an amazing matchup, but that's how the playoffs should be. That's how the playoffs should be, and I mean, really the the one team like Dallas is good. I mean, I picked Dallas to win the Stanley Cup before the year, so I think Dallas is a really good team. Colorado, we know what they are. Edmonton, I think is you're going to see a very motivated McDavid, Drysaddle. I, I talked about the pressure earlier. I, I think there is a lot of pressure. But I also think that those two in particular, you're going to see the best that they have. And the best that they have, as we know, is pretty darn lethal. So the one, the one team that I, I just have no idea what to expect playoff to, when the playoffs come around is Vancouver. Like That's the one team that I don't know. Like they, They've been good all year. They have great talent. I mean, we know Pedersen and Besser and Hughes. And you know when Demko is healthy and he's on, they're, they're good. So, like, all of these matchups, the Predators could certainly lose. But, but Vancouver is the one where, I, I, you know, they don't have a ton of guys who have been there before. They don't have a ton of guys with playoff experience. Like, I, I do wonder, 
Like, what's what's that going to look like for them once they get there? And at the end of the day, despite the travel, could that actually end up being the best matchup for the Predators? And again, it's hard to answer that because I don't think they played them since like November. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you know, and it's that's a, that's those are all good points. Um, it's it's a, there's a newness there on both sides and some and some you know with a lot of guys. So um, yeah, you know, look, you made the point earlier about Edmonton. Um, you know, I, I could see, I mean, we know that has been a brutal matchup for the Preds, but like psychologically, maybe yeah. that's, you know, maybe, maybe there is that maybe that's the most advantageous. I mean, yeah, it, it, it's about the, to me, it's about the Preds and, and how they're, can they consistently just count on certain things night after night? And, you know, that that's also, I think it was, um, I think it was Colton Sissons. I saw a quote from him about, about like when you're on a run like this, it, it almost can like, I mean, it is, it kind of does make it harder, right? I mean, the attention, the momentum and all that stuff, you have that great feeling, but also like, I mean, you can't, you, you can't take a shift off. Like you feel, you know yeah. what I mean? I mean, th- that's a good thing, but also you would think that during a stretch this long, it would be grueling and exhausting for a team. And maybe we've seen a little bit of that in the last couple of games. Well, and that's why, um, that's why I think it's important to go ahead and finish this off and, and get a spot clenched because I don't think it would be the worst thing in the world to have like two, three games left and be able to either rest some guys or really manage the bench if you're Andrew Burnett because there's no – I mean, look, it's been a fun run. It also has to be really taxing for them to play the way that they've played for the last month and a half at this point. Yeah. Now, of course, somebody will answer that and say, ah, then you, you get rusty and you want to be peeking at the, you sure. know, but I mean, I, 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 I'm with you. I mean, if you can do that and get a little bit of a break for somebody and you're not going all the way to the end, I, I, I would take that over whatever you might lose, you know, that's hard to quantify. So one, one thing, kind of the, the, the last point here on the predators before we move on to, to Koharski coming up here in the next few minutes One thing that's really interesting about this group beyond the way that they're playing right now, I haven't looked up exactly where they would rank here, but I have to think in terms of playoff experience, their roster has to be near the top of the list. I mean, obviously Colorado's got a ton of experience. Edmonton's got some guys with a lot of experience. But when you think about Ryan O'Reilly, Nyquist, Ryan McDonough, who's as experienced as anybody in the playoffs – Yossi, Forsberg, Bavillier's made deep runs with with the Islanders. Zucker, I think, has forty six playoff games in his career. I mean, they got a ton of guys. Luke Shen's won cups with Tampa Bay. They got a ton of guys that have played a ton of hockey in the playoffs. And and again, look, experience is nice to have. It's not everything when the playoffs come around. But I'm just saying, like they they have a ton of guys with a lot of playoff experience on this roster. I mean, you just listed all those guys and don't mention number one center hat trick uh, Colton Sissons. game. I know. Colton Sissons. Yeah. No, Add it's a great list. No, they, they no, they really do. It's it's that that is kind of an interesting thing. Like, and I think people look at the Preds again. Like even Adam said earlier, you know, young team and up and coming team and all that stuff. And I mean, actually, it's there. There's you know, there's quite a few guys, and there's a few guys who are really longer in the tooth but in particular just some guys who are still good but they're older and they have been through these things and that could be an advantage 615-737-1025 is our phone number 615-737-1025 more of your thoughts on the predators on our phone and text lines driven by wilson county hyundai.com we'll be joined here later this hour by paul kuharski from paul kuharski.com we'll get into all things titans with him And he was down in Orlando this week at the NFL meetings as well. All that coming up. You're listening to Robbie and Rex Road, 1025, 1063, the game.
Go to thegamenashville.com slash bracket challenge and fill out your 16-team bracket to compete to win great prizes, including tickets to see Kings of Leon at Bridgestone Arena coming up on September the 26th. The 1025 The Game Bracket Challenge brought to you by ESPN Bet Sportsbook, Twin Peaks, and Volunteer Hose and Gasket. Welcome back in, Robbie and Rex Road. Robbie Stanley, Joe Rex Road, Nick Keezer, Paul Kuharski from paulkuharski.com is with us here on the program. PK, good morning. How are Greetings, you? Greetings, gentlemen. I need to get a couple of Kings of Leon tickets. I'm a big, big Kings of Leon guy. PK, big. I would be into that. So is Brian Callahan. I was going to ask you if you wanted to go to see, um, oh, goodness, now I'm blanking out, Black Crows next week. Mm. Yeah, Black Crows, you know. Black, Black Crows, Crows yeah, listen, you know. I saw them like 25 years ago at Starwood. It was one of the worst shows I've ever seen. When I met Steve Gorman, the drummer, I was like, Hey, I'm a big fan of your studio work. <laughs> and we had a classic conversation. But then I saw him two years ago at the amphitheater when they were playing Southern Harmony and Musical Companion yeah. top to bottom, and they were terrific. And I would see him again in a second. We could get in for 90 bucks. Uh, Chris Robinson, lead so, singer of the Black Crows, was at the Preds game last night, Joe. Really? Yeah, man. Well, it's 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 actually wild that, that we're bringing them up because I'm in East Lansing right now, about a block from my college house and about uh, two blocks from Rick's American Cafe, which is where they played a surprise concert in, like, 1994. So, yeah, about when they had a show here. Uh, I didn't actually go to their show here, but my friend said it was very good yeah, in 1994. Right. Isn't that great Take when you can tell college worth. stories about bands that played that you didn't see? The Spin Doctors <laughs> yeah. played at Columbia yeah. for, like, the better part of two years. Never heard of them, never saw them. <laughs> then they were at the Beacon Theater like two years later, yep. all the rage, and I'm scrambling to get tickets. Oh, yeah. And they're like, hey, thanks to the guys at Sigma Nu up at Columbia. We played there all the time. And I'm like, oh, well, yeah, yeah, never heard of them. Good stuff. Good stuff. Spin Doctor as well. By the way, PK, when did you go to the uh, Preds game? Because I think uh, it was pretty close to when this either streak started. It was or the, the first game of- after the break. It yeah. Was Saturday game. Yeah. So that was uh, a good luck charm. Are you taking credit for this 18 game run they've been on? Absolutely. I just I, I I'm I listen, it's getting me excited. I'm just surprised it hasn't come with a bigger climb in the standings. And I'm listening to you guys talk about, you know, where they where they could wind up, but I certainly hope it comes with a big playoff performance and they're not uh using it all up now and that, that they can carry it into a big playoff charge. It'd be great. Yep, been a lot of fun to watch. So PK is back from Orlando this week down at the NFL owners owners meetings. Uh you caught up with Amy Adams Strunk. DeAndre Hopkins was wandering around down there. Lots of good coverage at paulkuharski.com. I, I want to start with some rule changes here, and we can we can all kind of get into this. So the kickoff rule gets approved yesterday where you're basically lined up 10 yards across from each other. It's the XFL-style rule. The idea is to, number one, eliminate some of these collisions that we see on kickoffs, and number two, try to get more returns actually in the game. What do you all make of the kickoff rule, what it's going to look like, and and do we think this is actually going to lead to a more exciting play on the kickoff return? I do. I think the first thing it does, it makes the preseason a little interesting. Like you'll want to watch the kickoffs in, in the preseason. I think some guys mm-hmm. who don't generally play special teams might play special teams. I talked to Rand Carthon about this yesterday, um, and he, he said another thing. He said – uh, you know, there are a couple teams that have guys that can kick who are not kickers who you might see kick in this situation because you're not looking to smash it. Um, and if you can get it into the zone, you get another guy on the field as a coverage player uh, run, who is running up with some steam that could add interest to it. But I just think the intrigue of uh, something different will carry the interest of the fans. But – Look, I want to see the play be interesting, but I don't want to see contrived stuff. And yep. this is contrived stuff. But I don't know how you get the play to be interesting without contrived stuff. And that's the conversation I had with with Chad Brinker, with Rand Carthon, with with Brian Callahan, with other people. And I don't know how you do it without contrived stuff. So I, I'll wait to see. But I do think it's going to be interesting to watch. It's funny that um, – uh, Jed York of the 49ers was one of the three teams that voted against it. And the reason he voted against it is because he wanted the ability to in-season tweak it as they see the unintended consequences. And nobody wanted, obviously, to in-season tweak it. Hmm. 
Yeah, I'm a, I'm I'm fine with that. I mean, the kickoff has been largely taken out of the game, and I understand why. Um, uh, so I'm I think I'm intrigued by this. I think it's it gives it a chance to be a, a play, you know, a, a play that's an actual football play again. Uh, for the most part, um, I, I, do, I do not like, we talked about this yesterday, PK, but the hip drop thing, I think is going to be a disaster, uh, or, or, it, or it's going to be, you know, let, it's going to be enforced kind of like the, the P the PI review rule of a couple years ago, where it's so rarely called that yeah, it, I don't it, think it's, it's gonna out be after a year. I don't think it's going to be called in the game much. I don't think it's intended to be called in the game much. I think it's intended to be officiated on Monday with the letter in your uh, in your locker on Wednesday. Well, that's fine. And and they'll they'll hash it out that way. I also think people are thinking it's much bigger than it is. It's not hip drop. It's a swivel hip drop. A lot of people were throwing out pictures of Kevin Dyson with Mike Jones. Yeah. That is not illegal under what they're doing here. Mike Jones it's made like a the textbook twist. tackle. He did not twist him, and he did not land on his legs. So I think educating the public is a big thing here. And that's what I asked Rich McKay. I said, look, people during the broadcast are going to be talking about was it or wasn't it. Fans and media are going to be talking about was it or wasn't it. Are we going to have to wait till Saturday to get the answer on was it or wasn't it? And they basically said, yeah. And I think that's a mistake in terms of educating the public. But what they want is first and foremost to educate the players. And I, I don't think that's a bad second layer of officiating that uh, – you know, players get letters and they officiate it out of the game with hopefully reasonable fines that uh, and and coaching during the week. Like uh, you know, Vrabel always did the film on 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 Fridays. This this is and we work on it during the week. We can't do this. We can't do this. We can't do this. And gradually it disappears. And you haven't seen the head down uh, stuff is like, there were like, like 12 of those last year, what three years after they put the rule in, yeah. it gradually disappears. And it, it's a rather effective way of doing it, even despite the out rule. So defensive defensive players right now have been really vocal about this this week, but you, you don't think it's going to end up being that big of a deal in terms of them having to change the way that they go about tackling people on a, on yeah, a grand I, scale, I, on a grand scale. I don't think so. And uh, you know, McKay said officials can call it, but they have to very clearly see all three elements. It really gives the officials an out to not call it in the game. And I think officials would probably, err, you know, a lot of times, roughing the passer, you're supposed to err on the side of calling it. On this, I think they've given them permission to err on the side of not calling it, and we'll deal with it on Monday. Six one five seven three six. Go ahead, Joe. I was going to say, and and look, if if the fines are steep for when they're really bad, that's great. But that's how I hope it plays out, as opposed to constantly, you know, calling this and giving the offense another edge. Yeah, and I don't think we want officials worrying about yet another yeah. three part foul that you have to tick off a checklist in your head when you're already missing stuff and stuff is already incredibly fast. I I don't want to add to officials. Uh, stack of stuff to consider in in the heat of the moment with the speed of the moment. Coming up next, it's time for the Rex Rant with Joe Rex Road. You can check it out every morning here nervous. on the program. Oh, we'll see not. if Rex Road brings it today. Yeah. You're listening to Robbie and Rex Road. 1025, 1063, the game.
Sometimes he wakes up on the wrong side of the bed. And sometimes he's just, well, Joe. Awkward moment. Let's do it. This is the Rex Rant. Now on Robbie and Rex Road. No one wants to be a part of that. No one wants to see, to, to see that ugliness. But I can tell you this. I wish she would have pushed Angel Reese. Don't push a kid. that You 6'8", don't push somebody that little. That, that was uncalled for, in my opinion. Let those two girls that were jawing, let them go at it. Kind of ugly, though. <laughs> it's that time of the day. Time for the Rex rant with Joe Rex. Road. Great time. You know, the, kind of ugly, though. That was, that was not Kim, about her, right? by the way. That was Kim. That was Kim. That was, that was uh, Kim Walton. Can I just yeah. quickly comment on Kim? Yeah, quickly. Yeah, when 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 the Washington Post gets to the point that it gives you a list of questions, it's been trying to get you to comment for two years. Yeah. Don't cry yeah. about hey, hey, saying yeah. they're insisting I answer questions right now in the middle of things. They haven't given you two weeks. They've given you two years. Hey, Paul. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. This is my rant. Be quiet for a minute. Thank you. God. <laughs> Got to be quicker, Chief. Trying to take over the whole station. Got to be quicker, Chief. uh, Okay. All right. I I retract. I retract (laughs) everything I just said. That's how you do it, quick and tight, Chief. Don't do dumb (laughs) to hurt the team. Okay, Uh, everyone quiet. Okay, here we go. Yes, I want to talk about Malky. She's the LSU women's basketball coach. I want to talk about Kent Babb, too. He's a Washington Post reporter who's actually one of the best reporters writing about sports. The sports world in our country has been for for quite a while. Best as in uh, thorough, detailed, precise, ethical, all the things that anyone should want in someone in our business. Because really, integrity is the only thing that really matters. And, you know, it gets questioned a lot by at Fred for Freedom 869-342-666 like never before. For no other reason than people don't like what the messenger has for them a lot of times. So full disclosure on Kent Babb. I'm friends with him, been for about 15 years. I know this is just more glorious name dropping on my part, but, you know, Kaharski knows how that goes. But I think it's important to note, one, because in any – you talk about this stuff, you'd always be accused of bias. Um, but also it means that I know things about Kent Babb. One, um, he likes the musical artist Meatloaf way too much. Two, he's he's a lot like our friend Charles Robinson, and that is a reporter who goes – way way deep on things to the point that he sometimes spends years on stories uh, like this forthcoming story on on kim mulkey you know charles we've talked about this he spent like two years living in florida you know blowing up in this miami hurricanes cheating you know scheme under nevin shapiro who was in prison and and gave him all the i mean you know these are the type of things they work on like bab an example of him would be a story he did on kobe bryant He got access to him. He followed around for a long time. He wrote this very complicated, in-depth, and fair story on Bryant and basically like his post-basketball life shaped by the sexual assault charges that were dropped. I mean, it's it's, it's a really great story if anybody wants to find that on the Internet. I know everybody's waiting for this one on the Internet. Here's one thing with both Charles and Kent and their stories that is guaranteed. A team of lawyers goes through every freaking line every source every word uttered in these stories it is vetted as much as you can vet something okay so i was texting with bab he's on spring break right now his wife his kids waiting for this story to publish and i don't know when it's going to happen i don't know exactly what's in it i do know that mulkey thank you paul had a preemptive strike a few days ago talking about how unfair it was that bab sent her a bunch of questions gave her 48 hours to answer after two years of refusing to answer his questions so, look, I'm keeping an open mind on all this, on the story, and you know, there's going to be people to defend her. I, I don't know. what Again, don't know what's in it, but I do know this. I'm not keeping an open mind on the idea that this was some unfair hit job by, in Mulkey's words on Bab, a, quote, sleazy reporter. I mean, by that rationale, then, everybody in media is sleazy. And that, I can tell you, is a load of crap, as is the idea that she'll have a remote opportunity of successfully suing anyone on this story. She was uh, obviously really out in front of that the other day. It turned into a, a distraction for the LSU team, and she, you know, was brought up again the other day in her post game press conference about this story that's forthcoming. Again, like you said, I mean, we don't we don't know what's in it at this point, so we're just gonna have to wait and see. She turned what it into on that a distraction. Front. She, I mean, obviously, whatever's coming, she is Scary. concerned about it because she got heavily out in front of it the other day and tried to derail the whole thing. So I have, again, like I'm with you, Joe. I have no idea what it is. Well, I'll read it, keep an open mind to what's going on, but uh, it was an interesting strategy by Kim Mulkey the other day. 
Well, and the, and you know, it's it's one of these things where I mean, the react there's a lot of reaction, and I mean, you know, it's Twitter or whatever the hell it's called. I mean, it's sometimes the worst place to try to like try to figure out the human race. But you know, of course, you have these people screaming. It's just oh, making crap up, and you know, and it's just like okay. I mean, that that's what she's she's trying to get that. She's trying to get out in front of that and get that going, get that ball rolling. Sleazy reporter, and I mean, look, she. I promise you, she lied about some of the stuff she said too, which is like she she basically claimed that he's like. Uh, you'll have anonymous. Uh, I'll give you an anonymity if you'll say negative things about her. Yeah. Okay, Kim. Okay, sure. And first of all, I, I again, I don't know the origin. Usually, these stories, I mean, I'd say ninety plus percent of the time, start with someone coming to a reporter, not the other way around, right? And so, you know, we'll see. It, it, I promise you, there will be on the record sources too. You know, named sources. There will be documentation. There'll be a lot of things in this, and you know, I. It, the fact that it's out there early is her, like you said, being worried. It is also interesting that Pat Forty tweeted about this story last, last week. week. I found that a little bit strange. Yeah, she did a good job of promoting this story, frankly. <laughs> she did. <laughs> she she did. got people excited about it. I mean, people it. like I mean, me and you are, are going publishes. People like me and you are going to eat it up for the journalism of it and because we're interested in Kim Mulkey. But uh, other people who maybe wouldn't have gone there are now anticipating it. Exactly. And yeah. it's going to be interesting. Yeah, that to see. site's going to crash. The site is going to crash. Like when, when it comes out, there's going to be a lot of reaction to it. And, you know, she is, I guess, unique is probably the best way to put it in terms of the way that she handles things sometimes. And we played the clip coming into the segment there after the altercation between her team in South Carolina in the women's championship game. I mean, there's an edge to her. There's no question about that. And, look, the results are what they are. She's been a great coach in terms of wins and losses on the court. But uh, I, I've always – and you've talked about this, Joe. Her likability is not really up there. Likability is uh, – it, it struggles a little bit. And, you know, the, the outfits are one thing, but just the, the way that she handles some of these situations – and I thought the South Carolina game was a great example. It's like, be a little bit more mature with the way that you handle things, sometimes publicly. And I'm, I'm interested to see when this does come out, how she responds to it. And, we're on, uh, and while we're on the topic of women's basketball, a much more likable coach, Megan Griffin of the Columbia Lions, who got an at-large bid to the tournament and nearly knocked out uh, Vanderbilt, despite a terrible performance from Ivy League Player of the Year, I had a lovely email exchange with uh, with the coach. Nice encouraging her and she was uh enthusiastic about my support a big booster without the financial part yeah a big verbal booster big of the program emotional booster yeah well so, thanks for driving this rant right into the ground that's go. wonderful well i, I mean i i did the rant i did the least. rant in two sentences <laughs> and we could have moved on uh, but then i let you go Let, let's rant about this why do you drive to detroit like will the athletic not fly you to to places because I came to see my kid early, and I'm taking him stuff. I took him stuff, and I'm also taking stuff? some stuff out of his. How much well, stuff? He's mo- well, he's well, Paul. What happens when you go to college? You mo- live in dorms. I, he had I had a box of stuff that he needed, and then I'm taking a couple bags of stuff out of his dorm to bring home to lighten the load for move out. Day. I have this Thanks fear that though. you love to drive places, yeah. despite the fact that uh, your company will pay. I for do you like to drive. I do an hour out of the way drive. last week to barbecue. Yeah, I got a problem. I've always with been. That. I'm a driver, but typically I'm four to six is the range. And then from there I'll fly. Um, and how far so is like, Detroit? Like, Indi- like people flying to Indy to me is just like, what, dude? It's four hours. How far get, is get Detroit? In, get, in, get in the car. Uh, eight. Yeah. That's too long to drive, Chief. Right. And I wouldn't have done it except for what except I just for told this you. box. <laughs> how would you grade Rex's yeah. rant today? Even though and you have <laughs> having an extra. Having I mean, an if extra I hadn't gone first, kid, yes. it would have been reasonably good. But. <clears throat> I, I did not speak at the beginning of Rex Rhodes' rant segment, obviously. I apologize, Joe. Stole your thunder. Thank you. That's fine. We'll have more with Paul Kuharski from paulkuharski.com coming up next. All things Titans for the next hour. We'll take your thoughts on our phone and text lines driven by WilsonCountyHyundai.com. Robbie and Rex Road, 1025-1063, the game.
Stand back. There's a hurricane coming through. It is that time of the week. Paul Kuharski from paulkuharski.com with us for the next hour. Talking all things Tennessee Titans. As always, we encourage your participation. 615-737-1025. Paul Kuharski presented by Parman Energy and Edley's Barbecue. Visit parmanenergy.com, your one-stop petroleum solution. And Edley's Barbecue voted Nashville's best barbecue for 2023. Joe, have you driven an hour out of Detroit for any uh, barbecue experiences that I could weave into uh, telling you about how good Edley's is? I'm in East Lansing, which is about an hour oh, away. Oh, sorry. Uh, I, did go to, I did go to Pizza House last night, which is very good. Yeah, Pizza House doesn't help me here. Edley's is a local <laughs> family-owned business and was voted the best barbecue in Nashville for the second year in a row in 2023, which makes sense because their food is spectacular and their service is second to none. Their goal is to make the world a better place by making people happy. They certainly do just that every time you step in the door. Go support Nashville's best barbecue at one of Edley's convenient locations, none of which will take you an hour to get to from wherever you are in Nashville or get Edley's catered for your next event. You can't go wrong with Edley's. Go check them out. So, PK, we had uh, determined on this program that uh, you had become somebody on Twitter that the uh, the national voices, maybe they just didn't want to see. Tom Pelissero had blocked you. You called him out publicly on Twitter. And one of the things that was accomplished this week down in Orlando, it appears that the relationship between you and Tom Pelissero has been repaired for the moment. People are calling it gastro diplomacy. Uh, uh, because it was at uh, brunch and these breakfasts where the coaches uh, talk, people forget there are actual meals there. And so the coaches finish uh, talking. A lot of people who don't really work at the breakfasts, there's a lot of silverware clanking and plates clanking you can hear in the background of the coaches talking. I don't know what the hell they're doing. <laughs> Um, but then, then you got to get in line quickly after this because they shut the thing down pretty quickly. I mean, you're done at 8.15, and this thing's closed down at 8.30. So I get in line, and Pelissero's in front of me. And, uh, you know, I, I'm a guy that's a face-to-face guy, not just a Twitter warrior. And so uh, Garofolo also in front of me with him. And so I say, hey, hey Tom, you know, he turns around, and I say, how long are we going to let this uh, you block me on Twitter? Go on. Go on. <laughs> and Garofolo, like, lights up. Like, oh, I'm going to be here for this. And I say, uh, you know, you got to. You got to. I, I can understand you blocking some fans that are giving you a hard time, but you, you got to be open to a little media criticism. I mean, when three of you tweet the exact same thing at the exact same time, you know, people know what's Come up. Got to be open to a little media criticism. And he says, you know, I kind of blocked you as a goof, which is, you know, nonsense. But I'm playing along. Sure. And uh, so we talk a little bit more. And he says, I'll, um, I'll unblock you when I sit down for breakfast here. And I say, oh, this is, this is amazing. What an occasion here. You know, so we're talking a little bit more as we go through the line. And, and I say, Mike, you got to get a picture of this, uh, this, this big occasion. So Mike takes a picture of us and, uh, and we, we say our cordialities. Uh, bad word there we're cordial and uh step away and then after i finish eating I, I walk by mike i tap him on the shoulder i say please be sure to send me that picture he said oh sent already and so i send out the picture you know breaking news uh Pelicero has uh, unblocked me on twitter and um it was with the picture and i credit uh garofolo and uh and he he is the first mention he says i give it six months <laughs> And then uh, Diana Rossini comments two, <laughs> and I say you guys need to <laughs> you guys need to work here for him to understand yeah. what what I'm what I'm doing here. This is a permanent reparation of of relationship. I feel like yeah, I I think yeah. I shamed him into the fact that he will uh, not. But when we got off the air last week, we were talking about Chase Young yeah. and the thirteen million dollar guarantee and how the Saints were crazy to do that. And we got off and and Jones from CBS said, here are the real details of the Chase Young deal. It turns out it's more like four and a half million guaranteed. <laughs> and difference. all the rest of it is per game bonuses and everything. Not that he's not going to make per game bonuses because the question isn't whether he'll play. The question is if he'll play hard, but it's still not guaranteed. 
And I it's not guaranteed. Did, I did the same kind of tweet where I said, how does Adam Schefter and how does Jordan Schultz get away with tweeting that it's fully guaranteed and not circle back and explain how they do that? And I saw Schefter there who gave me sour looks a couple times, <laughs> but he hasn't blocked me. But I don't understand how nobody polices these guys. They answer to no one. And people think I'm a jerk or whatever, but nobody's even doing what I'm doing. And I'm going to continue. And I know fans say, I don't care. Even on that Chase Young thing, they were like, we don't care about the financial detail. Well, as a Titans fan, you should care. Because Chase Young at 13 guaranteed is ridiculous. But Chase Young at 14-5 with a load of incentives is not ridiculous. And it's a deal that you, what was it? You said 14, 4-5. 4-5. 4-5. Chase Young at 4-5 or whatever it is with a bunch of incentives is not ridiculous, and it's a deal maybe the Titans should have considered. And I think that's significant. And also the ethics and the accountability of just repeating what the agent says at 14 guaranteed and then never circling back to answer what the actual thing is. I'm sorry if you think that's not important or relevant or whatever. I'm never going to cease to say that's important and relevant and inaccurate and unethical and all of those things. So if you don't like to hear me whine about that, turn me off on Twitter. It's important. And I I feel like because there's no watchdog on those guys, I'm going to be the watchdog who chirps at the national guys for being shills for agents and never circling back to be accurate. And bravo to Jason Jones of CBS for waiting and getting the actual contract and caring about it. And to guys like Albert Breer who do it the right way. But I think it's absolute BS. And, you know, I maybe won't go as hard as Pelissero because he's in with Callahan. He's got a lot of Titans news. And it's a pain in the ass for me to have to switch accounts to go, <laughs> to go see his news. <laughs> See, I I agree with everything you said about these guys, but this was almost my rant. I mean, you should have put his his face in the eggs. Well, well, show some backbone. What are you buddies with Pelissero? He's the worst offender by far. He is the worst offender. Although Schefter's very close. Well, I got that message. I got that message across. I told them exactly what I I thought. I said, if you're tweeting verbatim what comes with you, it's obvious what's going on. And I can't believe more people don't say it. I'm going to say it. Okay, but I feel like you, I don't see I you like, saying it. By the way, you want everybody in the <laughs> media. Like, everybody in the media, honestly, uh, the oh, people that I'm oh, friends I'm with love that I say PK. it, but they don't no, say P- it. You're full of crap. I, I've quote tweeted Schefter several times and said, "What the hell are you talking about? like the Deshaun Watson stuff?" Oh my god. No, I mean you, know, you are definitely the better troll of anyone I know. But um, <laughs> oh, thank you. But let's but put no. that on a new T-shirt. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. More T-shirt. You're the better troll of everyone. I know. <laughs> next thing we know, Schefter know. and Schultz going to be blocking PK next. I was glad to see it, though. Good well, to see I, you. I, you went down to Orlando. I, get pretty productive. I, I wouldn't have done it eggs. if he wasn't in with Callahan. If Callahan didn't like him, I, I, I would have been all right being blocked. PK but finally I, I got t- tired. Let me said, tell you. you know what? I, I'm switching accounts too much. Yeah. Tom, let's fix this now. Let me tell you how, how it works. <laughs> when you're blocked by a guy like that, then you see people talking about news, and you're like, what the hell? Nick Folk is resigned, And I'm like, what's, what's going on here? There's a, there's a bunch of talk about it, and I can't find him being re-signed. And I go, oh. And then I flip to my other account, and lo and behold, there it is. <laughs> You switched really your account. Fred, Fred for Freedom, 86935. No, no. My other account is just Paul Kuharski. And the reason I set up another account, we all did this at ESPN at the beginning, because my original Twitter account, if you can believe this, was ESPN underscore AFC South. <laughs> and ESPN was going to have control of our accounts and own our accounts. They were so scared of us having any identity and personal stake and ownership of the social media thing that we all were like, hey, we better create our own personal accounts because on the day they kick us out of here, they may own our social media. We better get some following on the side. But now that account says, this account is not in use. Follow me at Paul Kuharski NFL. Good to know there's at least one burner option for PK out there. 615. Yeah, my burner option has my name of. on it. Yeah, we know <laughs> Paul Kuharski right here.
615-737-1025, our phone number. We'll get PK's thoughts on what he learned down in Orlando, some behind-the-scenes information on the Legereus Sneed trade as well. Lots more coming up with Paul Koharski for the rest of this hour. You're listening to Robbie and Rex Road, 102.5, 106.3, the game. Hey, Robbie Stanley here. Brackets already busted throughout the nation, but it doesn't matter anymore. You could say goodbye to busted brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every single game of the tourney. Whether you're betting on a big upset, a one seed, it's time to go dancing on America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. Tennessee taking on Creighton. I think it's a good matchup for the Vols. I'm going with the Vols in that one. And I think Purdue also wins, setting up a big-time matchup over the weekend between Purdue and Tennessee. But you could take it any way you want to take it. That's 200 bucks to use on point spreads, money lines. You can even pick who's going to win it all. All you got to do, visit FanDuel.com slash Rob. Once again, FanDuel.com slash Rob and bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. Must be 21 or older and present in Tennessee. First online real money wager only. $10 first deposit required. Bonus issued is not withdrawable bonus bets that expire seven days after receipt. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Got a gambling problem? Call the Tennessee Red Line at 1-800-889-9789.
Welcome back in. Robbie and Rex Road, 1025-1063, the game, live from our Spring Hill Heating and Cooling Game Nashville studios, keeping your home feeling comfortable all year round. Robbie Stanley, Joe Rex Road, Nick Keezer, Paul Kuharski from paulkuharski.com. BK, as we mentioned, you were down in Orlando this week. Legereus Sneed, the newest member of the Tennessee Titans. Titans traded for him late last Friday night. You went uh, behind the scenes a little bit on the Legereus Sneed trade. Number one, what do you make of the move, and what did you, what have you uncur- or uncover about the way this went down for the Tennessee Titans? Well, I think it's a really good move. I never thought that the price, uh, particularly compensation price, would get to what it got to. I mean, the Chiefs are basically getting a better third-round pick uh, a year earlier than they would have gotten in, as a compensatory pick. Uh, in 2026, if they kept Snead this year, which they could have done, they could have fit him under the cap and, and you know, going for a three-peat here. Could have could have kept him for the tag uh, and got a compensatory pick at the end of the third round instead of wherever the Titans will be in the third round next year. Uh, and I'll raise my hand and say I tweeted at the beginning of this, you know, uh, when people were saying, oh, third rounder next year, you know, that's the equivalent of a fourth rounder this year. That's a very low price for a guy of this caliber, and I didn't, I didn't think that would be enough. Rand Carthon told me, you know, when they talked to him initially, uh, you know, the prices were just too high, and it wasn't an ongoing conversation through this. The Titans said, it's too much, we'll check back. And they checked back periodically. But it wasn't an ongoing negotiation for two weeks or three weeks or however long it was. Um. But they were also somehow confident when they looked at what other teams who were in the mix or they presumed would be in the mix had to offer. They thought they had a real chance that the price would fall and that other teams in the mix didn't have, uh, wouldn't be able to make the kind of offer that would outdo their ultimate offer. So they remained confident. But Chad Brinker said, you know, it also worked in combination with other things the Titans wanted to do, kind of um, fizzling, if you will. And so the Titans, I think, have done a really good job of pivoting. I don't think Ridley was a plan A guy. I, I mean, it's clear. Ridley wasn't yep. a plan A guy. They said other things came apart. And I, I presume those other things were Danico Autry and um, Aziz al Shair, but I, I've since been told that wasn't the case. So they had something else they wanted. Well, that's at least in part the case, right? I, I, I don't but think But there's something so. more you're saying. I, I, I think there was something more. I think there was probably a big fish they wanted somewhere else that they at another position perhaps that they didn't get and they pivoted to Ridley. And I think there was some Armstead. other. Uh, well, Armstead's not as big a fish. So maybe it was, uh, you know, Hunter or, or something like that. I, I don't know. And I think there was another path that they wanted to go on before Snead. Um, and and they pivoted off of that. But I think they were very flexible in their plan here and uh, and were able. And, and quite, quite frankly, Joe, like the way you're saying, if these were their plan Bs in some way, shape, or form, uh, you know, maybe their plan As weren't so great because, yeah. uh, because the plan Bs looked aw- awfully good. But uh, yeah. so- the, the other thing – go ahead, Joe. Well, I was just going to ask what you found out about, because the knee thing is kind of like, you know, I mean, there's people saying whatever, but I, the only, you know, the thing that's really verified is that he, he had swelling and can't miss some practices, but he obviously was great all year. So what do you know about that? Yeah. Well, here's what I learned on that, which, um, really is, is news to me after covering the league since, since 1995. Uh, Brinker said, and this makes sense if you think about it, but I've never really hashed this out, that, um, you know, you always think you don't really get the information until the the guy is in your trainer's hands and you get the, the medical. But also, right, 999 times out of 1,000, you know the guy's passing your physical. You want him, and you want him to pass your physical. And, and if you want your guy to pass your physical, he's passing your physical. But he said, you know, they exchange information. The trainers talk to the trainers. Once you've got the permission to talk to the player, you're talking to the player about his condition. He's obviously going to be rosy about it. 
But your trainers are talking to their trainers and exchanging information. You're researching everything you can. Rand Carthon was kind of investigating the rumor side of it and understanding where that stuff came from. But the research side of it, there's more information that gets exchanged than we would think in terms of it. And that makes sense if you think about it because Kansas City wants the trade to happen. So they're going to say, yeah, we'll share with you what we know about his knee. It's not as bad as we would. Like, they might be more hiding it if it was worse. But the Titans felt good about what they were sharing. It felt like they were getting a true assessment of of his knee. And Carthon said, you're never making a deal for a high-caliber guy unless you feel damn good about what you're getting back on that. And he also said, which I thought was very interesting, um, you know, generally you want a guy practicing, but he said ultimately if you're getting him on Thursday night or Sunday afternoon or Monday, that's what's important. And so I think the Titans are saying, if he's not able to practice as much as we'd like in this situation, we're taking that for in exchange for this guy. Interesting. So you've obviously covered this team since they've been here. Is this on paper the best cornerback starting group that they've had? We need to see it. I mean, uh, Samari Roll, Denard Walker. He just said on paper. Yeah, on paper, I think it's got a chance to be. Yes. I think there have been uh, two other very good groups, but it's been since the mid-2000s. So it's been a long, long time. Um, and I think it's going to be a very physical group. Here's one concern about Snead. Snead was whistled for 18 penalties last year. Now, 12 of them were enforced. That's a lot. That's more than Dylan Radins had last year when we were saying, oh, my God, how many penalties can but Dylan Radins But different Raidens, kinds of penalties, right? That's how he get. plays. Yeah. But, but penalties of aggression, I mean, obviously, you, you don't want a bunch of penalties, but penalties of aggression, and if you play that way, you, lo- you eventually lower the bar for what they're going to call, right? I mean, I think that's the idea. Yeah, but I mean, I, look, Sean Murphy Bunting, not of the same caliber by any means, but Sean Murphy Bunting was overly physical last year and got them in trouble by being consistently overly physical. Now, uh, with with Snead and Awuzie, they're both going to be physical. You're going to know what the referees are like heading into a given game and calibrate accordingly. Um, and I like the idea of them being physical, um, but y- you hope that he can – uh, you know, draw a, a few fewer flags uh, and, and not get called for a big one at a big moment. But listen, in terms of bringing them a defensive personality, um, th- this guy is going to do a lot in terms of that. Also, you know, I, I think the Titans need to worry about the AFC South first, and I'll be writing about that this week and, and what Brinker and, and Carthon had to say about that. But you're weakening the the team you're ultimately gunning for here, uh, not just this year, but for the next, you know, conceivably four years, hopefully four years, uh, with a guy that was a big piece of, of their Super Bowl championships the last two years. And taken away from the Colts. Well, there's that too. 615-737-1025, our phone number. More with Paul Kuharski from paulkuharski.com. Coming up next, you're listening to Robbie and Rex Road, 1025-1063, the game.
Welcome back in, Robbie and Rex Road, 1025-1063, the game. Paul Kuharski with us, talking all things Tennessee Titans, presented by Parman Energy and Edley's Barbecue. Visit ParmanEnergy.com, your one-stop petroleum solution. Edley's Barbecue, a family-owned business that is local to Nashville. Nashville is a barbecue city, we all know. And when I get a craving, there's only one place I go, and that's Edley's. Edley's is a local, family-owned business and was voted the best barbecue in Nashville for the second year in a row in 2023. Their food is spectacular. Their service is second to none. Everything on the menu is great. I go with either the burnt ends or the brisket plate. Edley's goal is to make the world a better place by making people happy. You need to make it a regular stop and see for yourself how they're doing just that every single day. Support Nashville's best barbecue and let them cater your next event. Edley's Barbecue, service with Southern Soul. Joe... I'm thinking, uh, what's the Titans' worst road trip next year? Uh, Detroit by, like, Winter City. Los Angeles by distance. Titans at Detroit on Christmas Day. Will you drive? Wait, that's not true, is it? We're just we're just spitballing. Some options. Yeah, I I, yeah, say, no, they, wait, they're you... playing two Christmas games. How can we get screwed? That's how. Yeah, no, I would not drive. Uh, well, I really need that to not be the Christmas game, though. Too. <laughs> now you got me freaked out. Yeah, I'd start. To, I'd start to prepare. It could happen. <laughs> you would fly though. Would you go? I think would you. Would you I leave your lines pop the house? And take the whole family. Rent a minivan. I mean, I feel, I feel like. True. I mean, you were really close to just buying that. all the way back in last time around. Like, are you, would you leave the the Dan Campbell T-shirt and the and the Lions pom poms at home It'd if it's a, a Christmas Day game? game? Conceivably, that's true. We I don't think the league will buy into the Titans in the for, for big prime time. Probably not. Yeah, Lions though. Well, they all uh, everybody loves the Lions. Yeah, that roar is oh, restored. Boy. There's no question. And Lions yeah. have Thanksgiving though. They're not getting Christmas. Yeah, you can't I, get that, both. That's what I should think. You can't get both. You would think. You would think. So PK, you caught up with Brian Callahan down in Orlando as well at the NFL meetings. What uh, stood out to you about that conversation with the new Titans head coach? Well, I talked, uh, you know, his conversation went to the, the positions where they have not um, addressed things. I think it's pretty clear that he is expecting that they will draft an inside linebacker uh, to go with Kenneth Murray, which is definitely a uh, necessity. Uh, talked to him about um, the lack of edge players, and he, he pumped up Landry and Key, of course, but he did not mention um, the other guys by name. Uh, so I don't think that bodes very well for Rashad Weaver or Caleb Murphy, uh, or certainly them expecting them to be, uh, you know, clearly the third or fourth. Um, you know, safety, they've talked to Justin Simmons and had Marcus May in for a visit. Uh, he talked maybe about the market downshifting eventually. So I would think those guys could still be in play. And there's not a lot of action going on uh, with them. And he said uh, Dylan Radens is a guard yep. uh, right now for them. So uh, Jalen Duncan. I mean, he keeps saying that. And, Nic- uh, and Nicholas Petit Frere are the right tackle competitors right now. And the right tackle could be one of those guys you know he said there's potential for them to add a veteran option at some point but didn't make it sound like it's a pressing thing so as of right now I'd pencil in one of those two guys and I'd certainly uh favor N- NPF at that uh Joe Alt they they did not go big at his pro day frankly my understanding is that Joe Alt wasn't planning on doing much at his pro day And then uh, people at his pro day kind of pressured him into doing more. So the Titans did have a rep there, but they didn't have a big-time rep. And they were in the middle of some big free agent stuff at the time. He will be here for a top 30 visit, so they'll get everything they need to see on Joe Alt from that. But I had some people that were in an utter panic or thought that the Titans were telegraphing that they were out on Joe Alt by not being at his pro day. Rand Carthon reminded me he wasn't at Skaronsky's pro day, and that didn't stop them from drafting Skaronsky. So uh, I, do st- I am starting to wonder, you know, and this is what happens because the draft is so far out. You know, if you have to start thinking about Edge as being uh, a player in this, I wouldn't say at seven, but I would say if they traded out of seven – 
to have two first rounders, certainly I would put Edge in the mix there. Um, and I'm about to publish Mike Herndon's uh, piece. Mike Herndon, the most popular uh, Titans coverage guy in the in the business. I know you had him on yesterday. Man of the people. Uh, you can read him at paulkowarski.com. And he's talking about you know the corners setting up the pass rush now and the Titans blitzing more with somebody like Kenneth Murray, which they're going to have to do based on what they have available to rush. But they've got to be able to rush the passer better, and they don't have the people to do it right now so uh, i'm thinking more about edge than i than i have been lately despite the fact that it's kind of offense 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 the way we're thinking right now with brian callahan and should be and that's what everybody's really excited about because uh it hasn't been that way for so long yeah my thing with the pro day was just like like you said i mean they they had people there but it's the value is some a, a chunk of the value is supposed to be in just kind of seeing someone in there you know, in their home environment, interacting with coaches and trainers and teammates and things like that. I mean, there's such a obvious emphasis on locker room guy, you know, what someone's going to be in your locker room. That's why it surprised me a bit. Does um, he love ball? But sp- well, and oftentimes right. you, you go to right. dinner with them or you get your coach out there to be hands-on with them and stuff like that. And so you miss out on that. But, uh, you know, I right. don't blame them for not going if they uh, or not having their big people there if they were told emphatically that he wasn't doing stuff. Yeah. So speaking of him, pressure on the text line, and it's become kind of a couple of things. A couple of things have kind of emerged this week in the Titans, you know, talking points on on Joe Alden and that whole situation. One, there there is this increasing feeling, I guess, that the Harpster might be looking at alt. And two, he needs a damn receiver it, is the one big thing. Yeah, I agree. But, you know, he's also he's a bully ball guy all the way and they need that too but also um the the and i heard trevor maddich trevor maddich had a really good segment with with jared yesterday breaking people down and he's not the only one who's talked about jc latham as someone who you know maybe should be looked at a little more closely here as a titans possibility can you get him at 11 i think you probably can probably you know, but can I, I, you get I, out? But can you get out of seven? Why, you know, well, you who get wants out of seven, seven for somebody that wants McCarthy, whose stock, you know, sounds like it's it's rising. I I, I think yeah. the quarterback pick is going to burn a hole in somebody's pocket just because of the fear, right? Minnesota wants somebody. The Raiders want somebody. Who's the third team there? 11, 12, Broncos. 13. Broncos. All three of those teams want somebody. So seven may be a little high, but you got to get ahead of of uh, you know Atlanta and I I don't know you got to get up there to go get them, and so I think the Titans are a pride a prime spot to go there, and if they like Latham, and I've got a story coming uh, where uh, and I'll I'll do this before the end of the week. I talked to Carthon and Brinker. You want. If you view a guy as a blue chip guy at seven, you want the blue chip guy at seven, or you want two very good guys that you could get in exchange for that guy. And and this is a conversation sports talk radio could have every day of the week, every day of the year. Um, you know, two very good guys on a thin roster, yep. or or one guy who you envision being, uh, you know, a good notch better than that. Ideally, you know, Hall, Hall of Fame contender you know and blue you can chip go, all the way you can go back and forth on that i'm blue chip all the way too but is all blue chip compared to latham you know what what's wow. the space between them and what kind of conversations are they having about that that that's what we're going to be talking about from now until april 28th or whatever the date is so we're gonna to have to wait and see what this looks like and how it plays out on the field and we talked about this the other day there will likely be a signing or two that they've already made that ends up being a disaster and doesn't work out. Yeah. I'm sure there'll be a couple that work out really well. Overall, though, I, I'm really impressed with what Rand Carthon has done to this point in free agency. I like the aggressiveness. I like the, the the willingness to go spend money, add to the group, the trades, all those things. What your what are your thoughts on what we've seen from Rand Carthon this offseason? Yeah, I think they've done well. I think a couple of the people are uh, particularly like Murray. Murray is reliant on what's in front of him, which we don't necessarily know yet entirely, and what's next to him. Yep. Um, and it sounds like what's next to him is coming in the draft, is 
are they going to spend a second round on an inside linebacker? Are they getting a fourth round inside linebacker? Are they trading into the third round? You know, I think that person's very important to what happens with uh, with Kenneth Murray, and that'll tell us something about what kind of player Murray can be because we understand coming in, he's shown some limitations in his in his first four years. So that one, you know, lends you some questions. But I do think, like, it, it, even if you look as a whole, three of the guys, you know, Pollard's coming off uh, an injury, but he's two years away. Yep. Or Woozy's coming off an injury, but he's two years away. Ridley's coming off, uh, you know, one year back after a year plus out. So they're all in ideal situations. Guys in the league are going to be hurt. Guys in the league are going to suffer big injuries. But we've seen too much lately of, of Titans coming in the first year back. So now you've got those guys plus Landry a year removed from his, his thing. They should be primed for stuff. They've doubled the size of the, you know, now we shouldn't call it strength and conditioning anymore, but, but that's what it is. Should that have a bearing? Uh, you know, and I should point out, Callahan said it's a piece. You know, too many people on Twitter are just drawing a line like strength and conditioning equals injury prevention. It's way too simple. It's not the way it happens. But it should be a piece of it combined with practice schedule and load management and all, all of that kind of stuff. So, look, everybody generally looks pretty good at this time of year. Titans look especially good at this time of year. But I, I get fooled this time of year by everything, whether annually, whether they've done a lot, whether they've done a little. They can spin it to look good. It's a new regime. There's a lot of energy and life and sensible explanations for what look to be very good moves. And so there's a lot of reason to be enthusiastic. But guess what? Houston's got the same thing. Yep. Jacksonville's got some of the same thing. Indianapolis, maybe not so much, but their quarterback coming back healthy. Division stands to be as good as it's been in a long time. And so uh, I think for opening day purposes, you know, it's more of an unveiling than we've seen in quite some time, probably since Vrabel's first year but different because of the offensive stuff. And even when the Titans have had offensive coaches, Malarkey and Munchak are hardly uh, Callahan. Yeah. Well, speaking of the, the history there, uh, uh, that's one thing I want to ask you, PK, is this aggression, because you're right, of course. I mean, we, you know, we're going to find out on all these things, and everybody can, can make a case for whatever they did in every NFL market in the offseason. But I do feel like, this is a high level of aggression and of achievement of getting guys right around the top at their positions that were available, including the trade for Snead. How would you compare this aggression level for a Titans offseason to you know, the, the ones that stand out to you in the past? You know, I need to write a story and go back and look at, at – people make it like they never have had offseasons like this, and they have. You know, um, I'll go to the one off season that always stands out it was a Chris Hope, David Thornton, Kevin Mawai off season. Yep. Now mm-hmm. that's not this in terms of numbers, and maybe that's not it this in terms really of, good. of talent, yeah. but in terms of locker room change. That was a massive season. You're bringing in a Hall of Famer. You're bringing in Thornton, where Bill Polian sat in the Titans press box and said. Our best linebacker is over there wearing uh, the other team's uniform, you know. And Chris Hope was a transformative guy that settled down the the, the secondary. And so they've had big off seasons before. People make it like, oh, look, they're finally spending. They've spent money on guys before. It's not like they they are consistently inactive there was one off season that that you know, stands out in everybody's mind where they did nothing for two weeks and jeff fisher had to hold the press conference to calm everybody down because they hadn't done anything and that you know things like that tend to stand out in everybody's mind um and and they're a more conservative team that wants to be draft based but you know look uh chad brinker said it out out loud to me like I'm not throwing stones at anybody, but we've had several drafts in a row that were not productive, which put us in a spot here where we want to be a draft-based team, but we needed to to be active here in free agency in order to kind of catch up. He's not saying anything anybody no. doesn't know. He's just a team executive saying it out loud. Yeah, And, uh, you know, credit to them. They're not afraid to, to say things out loud. 
And look, from a personal standpoint, um, you know, I got time with Brinker. I got time with Carthon. Uh, you know, I, I got time with, uh, with Callahan, you know, in a off the record setting at the party. I, I mean, I, I just think getting to know these guys more gives me more confident. It just gives me a better feeling for them. I, like this Sneed thing. I, I, they allowed me to kind of see behind the curtain a little bit of what was happening that gave me a much better sense from uh, compared to what I was hearing behind the scenes where I had some doubts, like, hey, what the hell was going on here? And when they sit down and then tell me what was going on, I, I think it's good for everybody to kind of yeah. get that feel. So I really appreciate that I had that chance, and uh, it gives me growing confidence in how they're operating. We'll have one more, one more segment with PK coming up next. Take your thoughts on uh, all things Titan 615-737-1025. Robbie and Rex Road, 1025-1063, the game. Hey, folks, if your bracket is busted, don't worry, because FanDuel is going to let you bet on every game in this tournament, whether you're betting on a big upset. We've had a few of those, Oakland over Kentucky, for example, or a one seed, and all four of them are available right now. It's time to go dancing on America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. If I'm looking at this weekend, uh, possibly the, the, the greatest round, I think round of 32 or Sweet 16 of the greatest round, Go local. I like Tennessee. I like Tennessee in the Creighton matchup. I like Dalton Connect has a real problematic matchup for Creighton, and I'd go over with him if you're going to do a parlay. 200 bucks, you can use them on point spreads, money lines, whatever you want. You can pick who's going to win it all, and I'm sticking with Purdue for that. Just visit FanDuel.com slash Joe102, bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. You must be 21 or older, present in Tennessee. First online real money wager, only $10 first deposit required. Bonus issue is now a trouble. Bonus bets that expire seven days after receipt. See terms at sportsman.fano.com. Gambling problem called the Tennessee Red Line, 
Welcome back in. Final segment of the day. Robbie and Rex Road, 1025-1063 The Game. Paul Kuharski from paulkuharski.com with us. Let's go to our 1025 The Game phone line, driven by WilsonCountyHyundai.com. Welcome in, Ed in New Jersey. Ed, good morning. Thanks for calling in. No, it's not New Jersey. It's East Nashville. (laughs) Hey, guys. Hey, Paul, just a question. Um, One thing I do like about the draft, ultimately, I mean, not the draft, the, the guys they're bringing in, Ultimately, you have to you have to prove it on the field. But they seem to be bringing in household name guys, guys that we know. Snead, uh, all these guys, we know them. Uh, even though you don't root for Kansas City, you know you know these guys. They're all pro. They're probably top ten in their positions. What what, what effect do you think that's going to have on our fan base? Thank you, Ed. Well, it'll have a great effect on the fan base, but fans are way too obsessed with that. Bring in names, 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 names. I mean, Jadavian Clowney was a name. Uh, right? How'd, how'd that work out? Julio you, Jones? You, oh, yeah. you got to have the, the, the production coming in front of you. You know, uh, there are names out there who are old and, and unproductive and past their prime. you got to anticipate future production, not look at, at the resume on the name. And so fans get a little carried away with that. Now, this is a very good free agent class with guys who are at the right age, um, you know, in the right stage of their career. But uh, I mentioned that Kevin Mawai, uh, David Thornton, um, Chris Hope, Chris Hope class. Yep. People didn't know Chris Hope and David Thornton, and that was just fine. You get to know Chris Hope and David Thornton, and they were very good players. So I think that knowing the names is too big a deal for fans. Though this class is meeting both the uh, name recognition thing, Tony Pollard, to name recognition thing, and the upcoming production thing, ideally. I, you know, it's funny too. Of course, Clowney has, was productive later, but yeah, he wasn't here. Um, you know, an- another thing on that point, PK, I've seen some, and even some people at the Athletic have have kind of tweeted this at least. Like, what are the, you know, what the Titans are loading up? Why are the Titans loading up right now? You know, and and I'm why looking not? at that. Why do like, they have to wait? Well, well, also like they're getting, you know, they're getting guys who aren't just one. Like the go for it, the quote unquote go for it is a clowny, right? That that's how I look at it. Like you're trying you're hoping you can get this guy for a year and he'll make a difference. You okay, second round pick, Julio, let's keep that Julio magic for another year or two cuz we're in this window. This is adding players who you hope are going to be part of this in the next couple of years, you know. Yeah. So like I mean, trying to get good football players who are in their prime, that's something that you should always be doing in the NFL, shouldn't you? Absolutely. Read Mike Herndon coming up. Don't block the box and do lock your locks. Right, Paul, thanks for being with us. Thank Great you. stuff down this week in Orlando. Paul Korski with us every Wednesday morning at 8 o'clock here on the program. That does it for us today. Jason Big Joe is coming up next. You're listening to 1025-1063, The Game.